G'day Bloodthirsters, AOS Coach here, and we have made a great blood sacrifice. Uh, I mentioned Slanesh once or twice in the live stream, and it crashed on me about a million times. Corn was not pleased. So we've taken this video and re-recording it offline. So we have a uninterrupted and hopefully good conversation this time. Or at least my guest is going to kill it and uh, carry the dead weight that is me being a murderous to the end. Um, I am talking about the new Blades of Corn Battle Tome, if you haven't recognized, by the way. And... I'm here with tournament organizer extraordinaire from the Old Town Throwdown scene, also Corn's top player in the ITC and the TSN Network's last year's ranking. So you're currently top Corn. You were last top Corn. Um, so we are with the absolute scar brand of Corn here. Uh, it's Gareth, aka Tomo. G'day, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, mate. It's it's been a while, and. Um... <laughs> We got through about 20 minutes of crashes. I'm like, all right, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. It's all good, though. So we got a new book here. And yep. Corn, uh, from just from my initial observations, I felt that the book um, was relatively well-balanced. And when I say well-balanced, I mean it's not like they brought down the power level and nerfed you to some type of middling middle ground of, of three and two but more that the internal balance of the book and mortals and demons both have a place. What's been your initial thoughts of the book so far and have you had any games with it? Um, I have managed to get a few games in, um, both on TTS and live. Um, I am very happy with the book. Um, I, I like it a lot. I think the internal balance is way better than it used to be. Um, I think the the classic balance between demon and mortal is still not 50-50. Uh, demons are still more powerful than mortals, I believe. But as someone who's an avowed demon-only player, with some caveats, um, I'm okay with that. Uh, I think the old book used to be very just monolist. You had to spam bloodthirsters, and that was the only way to be competitive. Uh, that is probably no longer the case. And in fact, spamming Bloodthirsters is probably not the most competitive way to play anymore, although it still does definitely have legs. So if I if if I got into corn before and all I've got is like the Bloodthirst to build, I can still run the army, but it's not necessarily the only way to play corn is what I'm hearing from you. Correct. And even though I don't believe it is the top top most competitive list and I'm, I'm not even sure i know what the most competitive list is yet it's still very early i'm going to be playing bloodthirsters forevermore I, mean, I love them too much as a you know i like big monsters and i cannot lie uh, they're just going in and smashing things is what i want to do um and bloodthirsters allow me to do that maybe less than they're used to but they're still a lot of fun so yeah you can have fun and be competitive with bloodless uh, bloodthirsters still i think there's a lot of cool changes. And by the way, we are going to go through a lot of the changes. We'll talk about the rules and how they interact. And we'll go through a couple of Tomo's lists to kind of see what he's thinking. But as he mentioned as well, uh, we are very early days. It's a week uh, from the book from really being kind of previewed. So these are very early thoughts. Um, there might be some erratas that come out that Games Workshop we didn't know about. So uh, obviously, if you listen to this in the future, hello, future self. But more importantly some things may change and uh, i remember i'll never forget i think it was was it the first update of the battle tome and i'll never forget listening to like face hammer talk about buffing skull cannons with wrath mongers and like for two weeks it was like the talk of the town yeah. and then it got eroded and like people got sad because they went out and bought four uh skull cannons and i think to this day people are now trying to work out how to buff up and maximize those skull cannons Although skull cannons are better now than they were, so maybe they have some play. If if I was new to corn, right? Let's say I, I got all excited about a preview and I went and got into my store and I picked this up for the first time. How would you describe the play style and just the army in general? So um, traditionally, yeah, you look at the law or the fluff, and I'm not a fluff or law guy. I don't really know it, but I, I know that we're the god of murder and killing things and we don't like shooting and we don't like magic and we just like getting in there and hitting things. 
you look at that and you think, okay, they're just sort of iron jaws from chaos, right? They're just, there's no, not much play style other than go in and smash. That was definitely not the case previously with Corn, and it's still not the case. They're very much a thinking army. They are an army where you win not by killing your opponent, you win by denying your opponent from being able to do things. You can uh, take objectives they weren't expecting you to be able to take. You can They declare a battle tactic, you can prevent them from getting that battle tactic. That's how we've always, or for the last you know, X number of years, been able to win games with corn, and that hasn't changed. That is still the primary primary way that you win games with corn, both mortal and demon. I think. So you're all about because corn has always been about he doesn't care where the skulls come from. Like as long as blood is being shed, you know, corn is happy, and that mechanic is still around. The blood time. Well, we'll get to the rules soon, but fundamentally, you are still a very combat driven army. You are an army that does not like wizards. So that still really has changed. Yeah. But I know a few people were kind of saying, and I'm, I've am i said it in the past as well, that I would love to see Corn more like a Daughters of Cain and an Iron Jaws. Um, and I think maybe this book felt, has felt like it, it, it does get, it get closer to the law. But I know you are quite happy with the tricks. Like what? why is it that you're happy with the tricks? And what is it that those tricks bring that maybe – if this book was redesigned as like an iron jaws, but for chaos, like what would you, what do you feel like you would lose uh, if it went that way? So uh, this is just my, me personally, my personal take. I'm not saying this is how people, everyone should enjoy the game. The way that I enjoy the game is twofold. One, I like gambling. I like randomness. Um, yeah. I often say that the reason that I got into TOing and I'm, you know, my, Sigma career is really as a TO, not as a player, is because as a TO, you get to walk around and watch all of the games at once and you get to see all of the crazy dice rolls happening. And I love watching dice rolls. Um, and the Boom Thurster always was and still is the greatest slot machine in the game, right? This you never know whether you're going to do, was well, it used to be just one damage, now it's a minimum of four damage if you get a hit off, or you know, go crazy and kill the opponent's entire army in one combat activation uh so i enjoy that and corn still has that the boom thurster is a little bit weaker and it doesn't go off as much as it used to but it's still got that slot machine mechanic that i love um and again me personally i like winning by tricks um you know i, I don't particularly enjoy gotchas i make sure that my opponent knows everything that i can do but that means that they have to play understanding what i can do and be and making sure they don't make a mistake i like to win games by my opponents making mistakes and corn allows your opponent to make more mistakes than any other army i think yeah and like when you look at the um the mortal side for example you get rewarded for not making making mistakes but obviously when when the opponent dies you get blood tie when you die you know, you can do the the mortal wounds back on return. Plus there's other like, you yeah. know, fight on death type mechanics and there's a bunch of things. So I always like when you get to pose a lot of questions to your, your opponent and they make the wrong decisions. You know, yep. probably the thing that I don't like about Iron Jaws is it's very flat and can be one dimensional mm -hmm. where when you put that same build into like a, uh, a big war, and all of a sudden you get different kind of mechanics and it's like, okay, you, you've got some tricks and you can force your opponent some questions, which when I, when you talk about it, it kind of makes sense. Um, yeah. I mean, Iron Jaws and um, other than Marathi, Daughters of Cain's the same way that as if you come up against those, it's very just straight. You know exactly how you have to counter an Iron Jaws army. You know how you have to counter a Doc army. Corn, you really have to think about what you're doing to be able to beat Corn, or you just shoot them off in the first turn. But you know, we have some tricks to prevent that too. Well, yeah, you've got some new tricks. Um, before we get into the tricks and before we get into the rules, um, one of the things I always love doing between books is going seeing who has had a glow up and maybe who has had a glow down. Is there yep. any units that have really glown up for you between books? Yeah, the obvious one is the uh, Mighty Skull Crusher. Uh, didn't look at them at all in the last book, mainly because they're mortals and I don't like playing mortals. But um, 
now they are so good that I cannot ignore them. Um, I have been trying to find some so that I can buy them. I, I put them into my TTS army. Um, I've got some proxies right now for my real army. Uh, I am going to have to convert them because I refuse to put mortal riders on them. So I'm going to have to find some demons that don't look like blood crushers. Um, <laughs> I'll I was going to ask, out. how are you going to do that? How are you going yeah, to do that? Yeah, I'll figure something out. Um, but yeah, the, the, the we'll come on to their war score later, but they are just probably the best anvil in the game right now, point for point. They're just amazing. Um, and that, that brings, particularly with some of the tricks that we can do, they're just awesome. Um, so they've got a massive blow up. Uh, the bleeding icon, the invocation, that is a must take now uh it's amazing it, i didn't even build it before so it, I, did, I didn't think about using it before uh as soon as i got the book i dug it out of my uh, drawer of bits and i put it together and i'll be painting it tomorrow so that's another one that's got to glow up um i know the... valkyr for me valkyr for me was like the first glow up because first off games workshop justice of valkyr please give her a new model like just stop it like go give her a new model but i love the deep striking like the ambush rule where you can kind of take her off the table bring her in from reserve and when she comes in from reserve has this great shooting attack that could pop that six wound idiot that's sitting behind a screen that you can't get access to or you need to just take away they've got a couple of wounds left um absolutely love valkyo yeah um i haven't considered putting her in a list myself but i can absolutely see i mean she is definitely better than she was mm. uh that it's not difficult to do though she was awful before so no she was terrible but she's not auto include but it just brings no. an interesting mechanic that maybe other parts of your army don't bring so if you want to bring something in yeah you can summon but um now you've got something else that can allow you to again come in from ambush that not cost you points well, uh, the, other, the other ones I'd point out are the uh, the demon heroes, the the blood master or the, the heralds, I suppose, the blood master, which is the herald on foot, and then the herald on throne, whatever that thing's called. Uh, both of those have gained the priest keyword, and we'll talk about prayers later. But prayers are amazing in this book, um, so they're they're useful just for that. Uh, and the herald on throne was one of the worst units in the whole game before but now i mean I, I have him in one of my lists and you can see yourself summoning him as well yeah when we get to the rules if you haven't seen the prayers i remember like because at the every at, in during my video i always try to say what my favorite prayer is but i'm going through <laughs> them luck. like i like i know but i'm like i like this. this is my favorite prayer but then you want these two but then even if i have these three there's still this other one that i want in my list so the fact that a couple of the other units have now become priests, um, so good. And obviously the benefit is that you can't unbind your prayers, right? So uh, we'll, you... we'll talk about this later, but um, the, the prayer law is amazing. And we now have demon heroes that are priests, which means we can summon somebody who can then get a prayer. So even if you don't have the prayers that you want in your starting army, Later on in the game, you can say, oh, I really need this prayer. Just someone, and it's a cheap summon as well. You just summon someone in and you give him the prayer that, you, that you're missing. It's, it's fantastic. What about things that maybe you've had a glow down, things that were auto-include, maybe in your list or pe other people's lists that you've seen? Um, like I know, for example, people were a bit funny with Scarbrand, given that some of the jankiness that used to be in the old book that really carried a lot of corn players back in the day um, has been removed. The six inch pile in the double fighting, all the, the little janky yeah. mechanics that have been lost. I know some people have gone, uh, doesn't have it anymore. No longer than take Scarbrand, but he still has a 3d6 charge. Now, do you think he's still worth taking or is it something where it's like he, he relied on that mechanic and because he hasn't got it, he's not worth it anymore. And I was talking to Phil Marshall about this earlier. Um, yeah, Scarbrand, I think, is still a auto take for me. Um, I, overall, he's probably not. Uh, there was you know, there was a lot of jank that you could do in general with Bloodthirsters, the six-inch pile in the double activation. We've lost both of those. 
which does make all bloodthirsters less powerful. Um, you could also, in the past, you know, he Skullvan has this mechanic, which he still has, that one of his axes on a one through five does eight mortal wounds, and on a six does 16 mortal wounds. So it's doing a minimum of eight mortal wounds. Uh, you used to be able to bump that so that it would do a minimum of 16 mortal wounds or a minimum of 24 mortal wounds. Minimum of 24 mortal wounds. Um, that's gone away. It's now just 8 or 16. I never used that buffing piece before. I never had a Blood Secretor. I never had Wrathmongers in my lists ever. Um, so for me personally, it hasn't made a change. And the benefits that he's gained mean that he's still as good as he was for me. But I can absolutely understand why people who relied on that minimum 24 mortal wound mechanic now losing 16 of them, uh, I can see why they're annoyed and, and don't think he's as good as he was. Uh, I think they're wrong, but I can understand it. So what I'm hearing is Scarbrand is still good. Uh, it may not be an auto include in every people's list, but even though some of the power level on Bloodthirsters and Scarbrand has gone down, it's not like you're putting them on retirement and Absolutely. You know, everyone, everyone sweeps to, uh, sweeps the mortals now. It's still a very viable. And there's some good things that have been added to them as well. And on, on the, f I will say that the Boom Thurster, the Blood Thurster of Insensate Rage, um, he was pretty much an auto include before, include before. He's absolutely not now. And I can absolutely see a lot of even bloodthirster spam lists not taking a boom thirster anymore. I'm personally going to, again, because personally I love the casino slot machine mechanic and I want to continue that. Um, and I not only do I enjoy it, but I also think that just the threat of it in your opponent's mind is very, very strong. I know that it's only going to happen 25% of the time. But in their mind, that 25% is an 80%. You know? And so I, I like playing with that. Um, so I'm going to continue to use one. But I, I think the inclusion rate of a Boom Thurster is going to drop dramatically. And with the glow up of things like, I mean, obviously, as you said, like uh, Mighty Skull Crushes are so hard to find online at the moment. Like all of a sudden, like I'm seeing Demon, un uh, Demon Armies now considering at least three Skull Crushes. Um, yep. I'm seeing people thinking about how could I include 18 skull crushers. So yep. like, like it, it's like it, there's there's enough glow up in other units where, for example, blood letters getting two wounds, like, okay, my this actually might be worth it. Or and as you mentioned, reach. the two-inch reach. Um, you obviously talked about some of the the heroes that have now become priests. So all of a sudden you gotta find points somewhere in the army and having a having lots of bloodthirsters isn't the only option yep 100 percent um all right do you want to bring up the rules or is there anything else you'd want to call out from like a it used to be really good now uh, not so much no I, I think uh let's go into the rules all right so um again as always uh Things may change. Hopefully they won't, at least on this page, but um, things may get tweaked. Uh, so let's talk about not slaughter host just yet because I'll bring their rules up and I'll get some of your thoughts in a moment. But the first one I wanted to call out was a comment that I've seen online a lot. And um, I just want to make the connection here. We have the, uh, the two in four units can be brought in from Slaves to Darkness. Yep. And initially, I know when you and I are talking about it offline, we were talking about um i initially was thinking that you could ally sorry you could coalition bellacore in but it was always off the back of the ally which is currently you can't ally slaves to darkness which seemed a little bit odd at the time but um i noticed you you had mentioned to me in the past uh things like bellacore you can't ally at the moment because not because it's not mark of core a chaos um and your cultists as well are they if that doesn't get changed, is that a big impact to you? Like, did you used to run Bellacore, or do you think um, people are going to have to rethink about how they do their armies because you can't bring in Cultus, Bellacore, or anything that isn't not marked uh, Mark of Chaos? Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that this gets changed, and it was just a silly typo. Um, there are a couple of typos in the battle profile for Corn in the book. Um, 
So, but if it doesn't get changed, then yes, as of right now, you can no longer ally slaves to darkness. You can only coalition, and you can only coalition units that have the mark of chaos keyword, which means we can't bring Bellacore. I personally didn't ever take Bellacore, but I fully understood why people did. And that was the greatest weakness that we always had was a sort of first turn alpha against shooting or magic. And Bellacore allowed you to just turn off one enemy unit, um, which allowed you to survive for that first turn. We are a lot more survivable now, so I don't know if I would ever recommend bring him, bringing him in. Plus, he's a wizard, so why would you want to? You know, you're just betraying corn by doing that. Um, the cultists is a much bigger one. Uh, we, I personally used to use the unmade a lot because uh, the one biggest trick that we used to have was the six-inch pile-in. Um, the thing that killed a six-inch pile-in was a redeploy, and the unmade stop redeploys. So they were an extremely powerful, and the range on that bubble of stopping redeploy was huge. And for 80 points, why not? And then if they die late in the game, great, it's just blood tithe anyway. Um, so they were extremely useful, and we can currently no longer bring them in. I don't know if I care that much, um, because we've lost the six inch pile in, I don't care as much about redeploy. And as you said, Scarbrand now has a 3D6 charge, so he's getting in probably pretty much whatever. And we have ways of giving other things 3D6 charges. So fine. Um, yeah, I'm not losing sleep over losing them. Uh, we did have, um, uh, what's the uh, Untamed Beasts for the pregame move, just to act as a screen to stop that alpha charge coming into you turn one before you were ready. Uh, or you know, stop deep striking like or KO coming down with their boats. If you've got that pregame move, you can push back their ranges a bit. That's uh, still useful, but um, we have tools that can help with that now in our own book. So, I I personally don't see um, any slaves of darkness units as being particularly useful either as an ally or as a coalition anymore. Uh, people used to want to bring anvils from slaves. But we have mighty skull crushers now that are way better than anything in the slaves book. Uh, the other thing that we can coalesce, co we can use as coalition, uh, are beasts of chaos. Um, I've been using a Saigor for a while now with the old book. Um, he's one of the best anti magic units in the game. Uh, he still is, and I can absolutely see myself continuing to use him. I haven't used him in any lists with the new book yet, but he definitely has play. And he uh, he pairs with one of the prayers that we'll talk about really really nicely, which is great. Is there other any other beasts of chaos uh, units that you would consider? Because obviously the Saigor is fantastic. Any army, even outside of Corn, I think as we move into a meta that currently we has Lumineth at the top, we have uh, Zinch at the top, and you can only assume when um, Seraphon come back on the table with their new kits and their new uh, book they're going to be a top tier faction as well. So having something like the Saigor and that anti-magic properties are going to be a great value. Is there anything else in Beasts of Chaos that is worth considering? Like, would you bring in, uh, I don't know, Bulgore? Would you bring in, um, like, I was going to can't do Slangor, but like any any other type of, of units? Um, Bulgors were popular before the new book. Um and I, I could see the attraction. I don't really see the attraction anymore. I don't think they give anything better than what we have in our existing book. Sorry, in the new book. Um, but, and this goes for any Chaos Army right now, the Cockatrice is amazing. Um, so I can absolutely see the Cockatrice just as a, a massive debuff unit, um, extremely powerful. They, they have an ability that on a four plus, a unit within six inches can only hit on sixes. That just means you can put your anvil in there and they're just not dying to combat ever can i just go backwards for a second and talk about slaves to darkness because you a couple of months ago obviously the christmas box was the new chosen you got you know your chaos warriors you got your knights um and there's a lot of talk in the slaves to darkness community about again varangards you know all those types of units and they're all mark of chaos would you consider, and I know you already mentioned that you don't think you need them. Does do any of them bring anything to the party? Like if I bring in a unit of Varangard um, or even reinforce a unit of six Varangard in a list, 
uh, market corn, does it bring anything to the party that your book doesn't already have or uh, fill in a role that's missing? Vanguard are you know, a fantastic war scroll. And I think they can do a job in any list, uh, in slaves, in corn, or any of the other guard armies. Vanguard are right now just good units. So yet yeah, they probably have a role, but they're kind of pricey. Um, they don't gain the blades of corn keyword. They just gain the corn keyword. And all of our buffs are only on blades of corn. Uh, so you can't buff them. You don't get many uh, synergies going on. So I, I don't personally see them. And yeah, again, I, my personal take is I like demons. They're not demons. They're mortals. Um, the models are insanely expensive. And they're very finicky. So for me personally, no, I won't be using them. But you know, if you tell me in six months' time that there is a corn list that is going 5-0 and oh that, at lots of tournaments and it has Vanguard in it, I'm not going to be surprised. Yeah. So what, what I'm hearing from you is that you can if you want to, but it's not necessarily mm -hmm. the bill that you want. So yeah. um, if people want to run Vanguard or Knights, whatever, it's there. Um, enough about the Legions of Chaos. I think we've talked about them to death. Um, you've got a couple of rules. Some are you, you new. Some of them are just modified or brought from the book. Um, Locus of Fury being focused around for corn demons. Um, so if your unit is outside of eight inches of all enemy units, um, it will have a ward of five plus. Um, but if you retreat, you lose it for the rest of the battle. So um, what's, your, what's your take on this one? And do you think you'll use this a lot? So uh, I love it. Um, I, I, it's ex obviously extremely flavorful. Eight inches, eight is corn's number. Um, we lose it if we retreat. You shouldn't be retreating your corn. We should just be killing things. Um, so from a flavor point of view, it fits in great. It also, you know, the biggest weakness that corn has had for years and years and years is that we are very weak to shooting and we're very weak, or we are weak to magic. We were never very weak, but we were weak to magic. But shooting in particular was our biggest threat. And generally, you know, it would not be unusual for you to lose half of your army in turn one against a shooting army. Now we have some protection. If you're demon heavy, you have a five up ward against things in that first turn. So will I use, I mean, sure, yes, obviously, if I'm going against somebody who can project power in the first turn, then yes, I'm going to be rolling those five up wards. Uh, after that, once you're actually in amongst it, eight inches is kind of big. And so I've been finding that after turn one, it doesn't really come into play because for one of my units to be targeted by something that and my unit to be eight inches out, like it's just not happening. I've usually got things that are amongst their lines that they're much more worried about. And so they're targeting things that are in amongst them rather than the guy at the back um, or the demon at the back, uh, which brings me on to the retreat part. You know, the, the you lose it if you retreat bit is flavorful, but it's basically never going to come up. Uh, one, it's very, or it's quite rare for you to retreat, but for you to retreat a demon unit and then be, more than eight inches away from all of your enemies' units, that was never going to happen anyway. So it, it, it's great flavor, and I literally laughed out loud when I first read that with joy. Um, but the retreat bit is kind of, eh, fine. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? Because you don't lose it in turn one, just in case anyone made that connection. It's the fact that by really by turn two, you should be within eight inches of enemy. So you should be in the thick of it. So you're not going to get the benefit. So just a right. quick clarification there uh, in case anyone made that connection. Um, it's obviously helpful, um, especially, although uh, when you think about it, right, shooting armies are traditionally low drops, ideally in the, in the one drop kind of vein. And they will want to give it to you first turn. They want to give you first turn. You're going to move up the board. Um, do you find that you've got like a turn one threat? Can you get into combat turn one? Uh, or like, is it more of a, just a, a turn one protection? You can use finest hour. You can use bronze flesh. You can do a bunch of other things as you advance up the board. So I'll answer that bit first. You can absolutely get in first turn if you want to with a single threat piece. 
You can't move your whole army up. You're not going to get your whole army into the turn at top of one, but you can absolutely impose some threat with a big Bloodthirster or Scarbrand on turn one, which is obviously great. Um, but the way I used to play against shooting armies was, yes, they would always give me first turn, expecting me to move up, and I never would. I would just say, okay, I'm happy to stay at the back. I'm going to do nothing turn one other than put up my buffs, get my bronze flesh off um, to give me plus one save and maybe move some things around uh, some of my little heroes, put them into Wildwoods or whatever it was to mitigate any shooting you've got coming in. Take the brunt of their shooting or you know whatever they could do. Maybe I'm out of range, et cetera, because I didn't move up. They go. Then they... Um, then it goes on to turn two, and I hope for the double from two to three, and that's when I move in and do all of the damage. That's still going to be the case, I think, but now I've got a five-up ward for turn one, and if I um, if they go top of two as well, I've still got that five-up ward. So it, it's, yeah. it's fantastic. I will say that I do miss the reroll. The Locus of Fury used to be that demons get reroll ones to hit, um, which was extremely nice, and particularly we'll come to the Boom Thurster. It's a makes a big change to the boom thirster uh not so much the other blood thirsters but uh so i do miss that but i prefer this and to be fair like they've been removing re-rolls from the entire yes. game yes. so it's it's not like it's specifically targeted against corn but i can appreciate where you're Absolutely. coming from let's put that to the side for a second and let's talk about the other brethren which is going to be your bloodbound aka mortal side so each time a friendly bloodbound model is slain um basically if you're within an enemy if you're within three inches of an enemy you get to roll a murder dice on a five up that unit suffers one mortal wound um if it was a, a bloodbound hero you'd make three mortal wounds so what's your thoughts on this one um if you'd asked me yesterday i would have told you that it was meaningless and didn't do anything uh, this morning i played against a mortal corn player and um my boom thirster went in and received, I think, 14 mortal wounds on the kickback um, after he killed the unit, which surprised me. Um, I think, you know, if you're going mortal heavy, uh, you can absolutely build around this. Saying, you know, roll one dice on a five up doesn't sound a lot, but there are a lot of war scrolls in there that uh, are ways to buff that so that you're rolling more dice or it's happening more reliably. And, uh, you know, it, like blood reavers are still puny little humans that don't do anything, but you can spam them and spamming them, they die, but they do mortals on the bounce back. It, it can be useful. Uh, if you're someone like me who's running not quite a mix, mainly demons, but has some mortals, you can forget about using it. I mean, I, the number of times I've just forgotten that this ability exists and my skull crushers have died. I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot to do that. Who cares? Um, so it, it's useful if you are spamming mortals, MSU, or even big units. Uh, but other, outside of that, uh, you can probably just forget about it. When you look at the Blood Reavers, like I was listening to Seasons of War Jordan the other day, and uh, he made a comment that he's like, oh, I, I happen to have like 80 Blood Reavers at home. And um, he did the maths, and I think uh, seventy blood reavers works out to be just over five hundred points. And when you think when you think about like 70, 70 bodies that are going to generate you blood tie, um, obviously do some combat and some bounce back mortal wounds, and you still got fifteen hundred points or fourteen hundred points for the other things. It's like that's a lot and yeah. it allows you to do a lot of things. So like obviously put blood reavers aside. Yeah. And like, do you want to build that strategy around some of the other blood bound models? Probably not. You don't get a lot of value. Uh, I'm certainly not going to be trying to get my heroes killed to get three murder rolls, but you'd be surprised how many splashback mortal wounds for each model that, you know, dies. So I don't yeah. mind it. I mean, the, the uh, blood reaver spam list, you can, you can design a list that is all demons and then just put down MSU, Blood Reavers, and summon your army. You know, it, you can generate Blood Tithe so easily now, and you're not, we'll talk about Blood Tithe, you're not spending as much as you used to, but summoning, you can absolutely summon a lot of demons, even if you start off with a lot of mortals on the board. 
Well, that, that could be a great way to get around what you mentioned around the cultists, right? You know, you'd have that cheap screen. Yeah, they might not have a pregame move, but they can still be a meat shield, be very, very cheap, do some bounce back mortal wounds to whatever threat gets into your face early. Um, and then also generate you some some cheeky blood ties so you can get early up um, the board sooner. Um, so I absolutely agree that that's a tactic. It's just not for me. Pushing that many bodies around, no thank you. And painting that many blood reavers, absolutely not. No thank you. Talk to me for a minute about someone who's not you. Would you run, because obviously you can run all demons, you can run all mortals. Do you think it's viable and do you see a world in the new book where people will mix and match? It might not be 50-50, but do you see people running like a combined arms of mortals and demons? I mean, I would say that the two absolutely must take units in the book right now are Mighty Skull Crushers, which are mortals, and a Bloodthirster of Unfettered Fury, which is a demon. So I, I would expect that every competitive list is going to have at least one demon unit and at least one mortal unit. Um, I think you can you can obviously build a list that is 50-50 and still do well with it. There are enough mortal units that you can do that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I probably would always, I, I mean, whenever I build lists like that, it's more like 70, 30, but it's mm -hmm. more that, you know, you can you can mix and match. It doesn't, the book doesn't force you into one build. Yep. So a Hatred by Sorcery is what you would expect. It is a uh, protection to spells. So you can shrug uh, spells or the effects of endless spells on a five plus. Uh, and in addition, if you do shrug the spell or the uh, the endless spell, you will receive one command. Oh, well, command point, blood tithe point. Um, I mean, it's a passive. It's passive. If you go up against a lot of magic, awesome. If not, I mean, a one in three chance of ignoring effect of a spell and endless spell is is decent. Um, there's no. There's nothing that's like stops you like the locus of fury. Like just there. Yep. Um, do you build around this? Is this just something that's like a nice to have? It just kind of comp complements nicely with like your flesh hounds. Yeah. I mean, you don't build around it. I don't know how you would build around it. It is nice to have, um, you know, you can so far, everyone that I've asked to play me with Lumineth or uh, Zinch have refused because of this rule. Um, but you know, you go into a tournament and you're facing Zinch with their damage spells. You're like, Okay, great. I, I think I can take this now uh, because, particularly, you know, against Zinch, who's going to be slinging out eighteen-inch mortal wounds at you with uh, spells. You get a five-up spell ignore, and then you get a five-up ward against the damn the ones that you don't ignore. And as we come onto Blood Tithe, you have ways of improving this as well. So it, it's great. Um, yeah, it's flavorful. And again, our weakness was always that turn one getting half your army lost because of magic or shooting. This is what stops the magic. You, you're, you're literally ignoring a third of all the spells they throw at you. Yeah, so it really should mean that when you get into combat, you are going to have more of your force that you used to than you what you used to have. Because yep. again, between locus and um, uh, that role rule, um, a sorcery, hatred of sorcery, you you should shrug a few a few more more wounds off. Yep. Let's talk blood tie as an overall mechanic. So people can read on the screen or they've heard me talk about it in the preview book. Basically, every time something dies, whether it's yours or mine, you uh, you uh, every unit gets you a blood tie point. Uh, there are two different sets. You can either uh, use your blood tie in the movement phase to summon a unit and or you can use them in the hero phase for a bunch of benefits. Uh there was a white dwarf update that's been carried over so now you're not resetting which is obviously a great thing as well um why that happened i never know why you you just went back to zero back in the old days but talk to me about how you use blood tithe like when you think about it are you building lists that are trying to die as quick as possible to get to a, a starting point of blood tie are you keeping them up your pocket to summon something really big are there particular blood tide abilities that you really want how do you unpack this so if you don't mind let me talk about how blood tithe used to work or the blood tithe table in the old book please um previously 
you used to spend blood tithe at the start of the hero phase. Now it has changed to be the end of the hero phase. And it is either hero phase, yours and your opponent's. And that's actually a big change. Um, both It has both positives and negatives. In the old blood tithe list, the only things I ever did was you could move, make a normal move with one of your units for three blood tithe, or you could fight if a unit was in combat uh, for four blood tithe. And with the three, you could also charge. You could either make a normal move or charge. And I would exclusively use those two. Uh, move, the way that you win games of Age of Sigma is by moving when your opponent doesn't expect you to. Out of sequence moving is a game winning mechanic. And that's generally how I used to use Blood Tithe. And it's all I would spend Blood Tithe on. I very, very rarely summoned uh, in the old book because I was spending three Blood Tithe to move whenever I could go back down to zero, kill three units, or use a prayer to get a Blood Tithe point, and then move again, or sometimes fight. And that could be a, a literally a game-winning mechanic was you know, your, your opponent would declare their battle tactic. It was to kill one of your units. You say, okay, I'm spending three blood tithe and that unit is moving away from you. Good luck. Or, you know, or my Scarbrand is fighting the guy that you've said that it has to kill somebody. Uh, good luck. He's now dead because Scarbrand has fought him. So blood tithe has always been a way to stop your opponent doing what they want to do. That is still the case now. The blood tithe table still has that, but they have changed things up dramatically and um now you no longer can spend three blood tithe to make a normal move or a charge now you can spend one blood tithe and move three units d6 now that d6 is obviously not consistent you can't bet on how much it's going to be you know with a normal move you knew your blood thirsters were going to be able to move 10 now it's only d6 so it's less and you don't know exactly how much it's going to be but it's three units and being able to move three units around in their hero phase and your hero phase for just one blood tithe is insane. This is the best ability in the book by far. Spending that just one say, blood tithe is game changing. Can I just say the last part of that sentence is what really drags me in? It's like you can finish this move within three inches of yes. an enemy unit. Yes. So if you're like, if your opponent's like, I'm going to kill this certain unit and I have this buffed up unit of, I don't know, cavalry drathgoths like dragons whatever you're like cool i can spend this blood tie to move my unit of blood reavers idiots and just tie up that unit of buffed up units and all of a sudden you've now denied them that battle tactic you've stopped them moving where they want to be or you've now forced a retreat they can't get into combat right. uh you've pinned something in that didn't want to be pinned um that is powerful i love that last part yeah Okay, I'm going up against 30 Sentinels. In they'll give me top of one. I will, and I we have ways to move a lot. So I will move my um, mighty skull crushers, who have a two-up save, to 3.1 inches away from their um, sentinels. And then come the charge phase, I don't charge them. And they look at me saying, Why aren't you charging me? I don't want to face the unleash hell. I'm gonna wait until your turn. And then in their hero phase, you just roll that dice and all you have to do is make a 0.1 inch roll, which obviously you're going to do. And those Sentinels are now in combat with a unit of three Mighty Skull Crushers, meaning that your Bloodthirsters or the units that you care about are not going to be able to be shot. And you can do it with Skull Crushers, Flesh Hounds who also move quickly. And, you know, a unit of five Flesh Hounds, that's, they've got a big um, footprint on the table they can tie up three or four units pretty easily just with a d6 move in the hero phase it's it's, it, it's game winning it does make you think about your army a little bit differently like they say for example they got the blood crushers uh you might use you might spend a command point to make them run six and you get them as you said within mm -hmm. three you know and as we know skull crushers have a uh two up base save you know, put bronze flesh, put all that defense. You can soak up a whole bunch of rend. You've now pinned down those sentinels or let's say the Marathi's bow snakes, whatever it is, with an incredibly fast, durable, lots of wound unit while the rest of your army has a field day on the battlefield. Like it yep. does make you think about things a little differently when you put the tricks in play. I love it. And it's, and it's not even just shooting. Uh, you're going into Stonehorn. Great. 
you know, the Stonehorn, one you tied up with Skull Crushers, who, yeah, could be on a zero plus save. So, yeah, enjoy your two rend. I'm still on a two up save. Or, you know, a lot of combat units get huge bonuses when they charge. I'm sorry, you're not charging me because I'm already in mortals. combat with you. Yeah. They want to do mortals on the charge. You can soak that up because they yeah. can't Yeah, impact charge hits or the, uh, you know, the Stone Crusher fly 3d6 if it made a charge move. Sorry, you didn't make a charge move. I, I got into combat with you. So, um, yeah, it's it's just bonkers good. And it's so good that I find myself using it exclusively. And very rarely am I using any of the other parts of the Blood Tithe table. Um, you know, we can talk about it. For two, you can stop a spell. This has changed slightly. It used to be that the spell was not cast. Now it's just an unbind. So if the spell is not able to be unbound, you can't use this, which is a bit of a shame, but I understand them wanting to make all of the language the same. Uh, if your opponent has an extremely important teleport spell or something, or you know, total eclipse or something that's really going to be uh, beneficial to them, just you know, rather than moving, just say, no, you're not getting that spell off. Um, for three points, you can do a bunch of mortals to somebody. You know, you've got some hero who's left on two wounds, who's you know, going to be doing, tapping some objective or something. Yeah, just kill him. That's useful. Um, if you are going against Zinch, then you get up to five and you improve your spell ignore to a four plus. Great, thank you. I'm now ignoring half of your spells. Uh, that's fantastic. Would that be valuable, though, given that you want to be within eight inches and smash them in the face anyway? Like, you'd... Like, because one of the things is you can uh, pick rising hatred and slaughter a triumphant multiple times. Yeah. That by the time you get those five blood tithe points, for example, to increase your hatred of sorcery role, like, is it really worth it? I feel like you know. I have to admit, the first time I play against a you know, magic heavy zinch list, I'm just going to stand back and just wait for that to happen. I'm just going to get there and just laugh. And then once I get to a four up, I'm going to keep shooting magic at me. I'm going to get it to a three plus and I'm going to get it to a two plus. And then I'm going to come in. I'm basically immune to your whole army. I mean, that's not the competitive way to do it, but I'd find that amusing. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, it, if you're playing a mortal MSU unit, you may find that you get to five blood type very quickly. And so, mm. sure, why not? If you're going up against a, a magic heavy army, why wouldn't you? Um, the, the improve the Ren characteristic, it's only for one turn. It's six blood tithe, probably not. Um, the, the seven blood tithe, every enemy unit within three inches suffers D3 mortal wounds on a two plus. No, thanks. That's not worth seven. And then add one to the attack characteristic of your, of your army for the rest of the battle. Again, if you're running an MSU mortal heavy list, yeah, <laughs> yes, please giving every single one of your 70 Reavers an extra attack. Yeah, great. I think the challenge, though, is, and you are got to remember this, folks, is to get to this point, eight, seven, that's seven units need to die of yours or your opponent's. So you've got to keep that in mind. And I think, as um, Tom said, you know, yeah, sure, doing D3 mortal wounds on a two-up sounds great, but that's seven units, yours or theirs, dying. So if you kill seven of your opponent's units, what's left do you even need it um yeah. or if it's seven units of yours or four of yours then what's died to get to that point and is a couple of mortal wounds enough i agree but again if you there are ways that you can jump start the blood tithe um you know we'll talk about them later but it's not just units dying that get you blood tithe and if you build into that or you know uh in the old book, we had this on a, you know, the, the spell ignore was on a six plus. So there was one game I played that's quite famous in the local community against a, a Lumineth player was uh, Teclas did his AOE. Is it Searing Light? Yeah, you know, he's got a spell that damages every single one of your units. And he did that to me top of one and hit every single one of my units on the table and did a total of three mortal wounds across my whole unit, uh, I guess across my whole army and gave me five blood tithe in the first turn so it can happen in which case if you start the first turn with five blood tie then sure why wouldn't you think about doing some of these higher ones yeah we just talked about hatred of sorcery where if you do roll that five up uh google assistant we talked about uh <laughs> 
of that. Hatred of sorcery giving you a blood tie if you successfully do the five up shrug. So yes, you're right. There is other ways outside of units dying. So keep that in mind. And uh, again, it's a resource, but I'm hearing murder lust is a great one to be using constantly. And yep. we've already spruiked the benefits. And uh, keep in mind that it's at the end of the hero phase. So we still have the blood sacrifice prayer, which we used to have, that we can pray in the hero phase to ga gain us a blood tithe. Previously, that wasn't useful in the same term because you had to spend blood tithe at the start of the hero phase. Now you're mm -hmm. spending it at the end. So even at the top of one, you have one blood tithe if you could use that prayer. So you can you can do murder lust at the top in the top of one often if you build towards that. I know you said in the past that you don't summon a lot of demons and there may be situations where you need to control an objective. You want to bring on an extra priest um, for whatever reason. Uh, obviously there's lots of different reasons to summon potentially. Are there any particular demons that you prioritize over the others? Obviously every battle, every battle plan, every situation will be different, but are there ones that maybe you lean to more than others? Yeah, so first of all, I'd say that I'm finding now that because I'm only spending one blood tithe from the table, I do actually have a lot more blood tithe to spend on summoning. So I am summoning a lot more than I used to. And in fact, I'd probably say that we're one of the more powerful summoning armies now, um, which didn't used to be the case because blood tithe was so useful in the past that we would always spend it on that. Now you're just spending one. So you, you end up having a lot more points to spend on summoning. Uh, in the current... Uh, GHB season where GCs are getting you so many extra points. We can summon a blood master for three blood tithe. He's a GC. You can summon him onto an objective and capture it as a GC, which gives you extra points in a lot of the battle plans. Um, he's also a priest, so he gets a prayer that you can choose. Um, so he's obviously an extremely strong three blood tithe summon. I, mean, I, I would expect to summon one of those at least once again. Uh, very strong. If you're running uh, the Bloodletter builds, then summoning Bloodletters or the um, Herald of Corn on Blood Throne. I can see both of those being useful. The Herald of Corn can buff Bloodletters quite nicely. So just being able to summon him to support your Bloodletters is useful. Um, it may be a bit of a meme, but I think summoning a Skull Cannon can be useful. Uh, there are ways, there are some tricks you can play to be able to summon in your opponent's back lines. And so if they've left some piddly little hero behind protecting an objective, just summon off a, a summon up a skull cannon who's then got four shots at 18 inches. So you can actually shoot that hero. It can be sneaky. Um, so that has some play. Uh, probably not every game or anywhere near every game, but maybe once a tournament you do it. It's worth having it in your summoning box. Uh, the Bloodthirsters, they've gone up. It used to be eight. It's now 10 blood tithe to summon them. It's very much a win more. If you're able to summon a Bloodthirster because you have 10 Blood Tithe and you're not spending it on anything else, you're probably already winning the game, so it doesn't do anything. It's. I think it's going to be quite rare that summoning a Bloodthirster is the tactical competitive play. You're usually going to be better off summoning a Bloodletter host because they get plus one to charge. Um, Flesh hounds get plus two to charge. So you summon them nine away. They only need to make a seven inch charge if you're going to go in somewhere. So probably uh, the flesh hounds or the blood letters are going to be more useful to you competitively than a bloodthirster would be, but it's always fun. So why not? Were, were bloodthirsters unique in the old book? Uh, they were single, not unique. They were single. Yeah. Okay. I was just thinking like, could I, because uh, one of the things that I thought, I was thinking about was could I bring in like multiple versions of you know the Wrath of Corn for mm -hmm. example and I'm looking at it at the moment and I couldn't remember if they was they were unique and single and I'm looking at the uh, the book at the moment and they're not single slash unique yeah the which... fact that they're not single is clearly a typo you shouldn't be able to reinforce a blood <laughs> um but they, they will never be unique you need to be able to give them command traits and artifacts and all of that stuff so they won't sure, be unique, yeah but they will be single Yes, that was that was probably what I was thinking. Not the unique yeah. Scarbrand is unique. He's yes. special. He's special. Um, I will say that one subtle difference is that we can now uh, summon wholly within sixteen of the altar. That's a pretty big range. You you deploy your altar on the front line, you'll be able to summon 
sometimes into their deployment zone. Some, you know, if there's a center objective, you'll be able to summon from the altar onto that objective. And even if they smash the altar, it doesn't change it. You can still summon from it. So um, that, that's really nice. Yeah, and the the benefits as well of like the skull altar being changed as well. So like non, you used to be able to get non priests to get on top of it, and they count as priests. Now you're just increasing the, your invocation ranges. So by the time someone gets into and, and smashes your skull altar, you, it's, yeah. it's probably not such a bad thing at that point in time. Yes. So normally I would go through command traits, and we would eventually get to the the, the prayer law slash spell law, but I felt like, well, we felt that in talking at the prayer law first before the others was probably important. Why, why prayers? And how do we, how do we want to tackle this one? Because you and I both agree that there's more than just one or two good prayers. It feels like you want to have probably three on average, three good prayers in your list, maybe four, if you're a more of a, a mortal side. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I'll say that there's been a, a trend in all of the books over the past few months that we've seen where a lot of these artifacts, command traits, spell law, it used to be a couple of years ago that you'd get 12 and two were good. Now it's often the case that they're all good. And for that, our prayer law, every single one of these is amazing. Uh, these are just fantastic prayers and you absolutely want to use every single one of them. Um, I think... I, Every list that I've written, I've taken the extra extra prayer um, enhancement from a warlord battalion or command entourage. Uh, you know, when was the when have you ever seen an extra prayer being taken from a, a battalion? It's now going to be. I think every list I'll do it. Uh, these prayers are so good. And again, if you take the extra prayer law, uh, extra prayer enhancement, every time you summon a priest, he knows two prayers on top of his war score one so you know it's three um these things are bonkers good and can i, pa can, can, can I pause go. you before we get into the prayers most people when they go for like warlord they'll go for uh an extra artifact mm -hmm. so why would you go prayers over artifact because I, I, I could put a bunch of artifacts on my my thirsters yeah. and just and absolutely. When go we up. see artifacts, you'll see that we have a lot of really good artifacts. So it yeah, it's a, it is a um, a choice you need to make. But these things are so good that you absolutely need to take. And the incantations are good as well. So we, you need to have a lot of priests, and you need to have a lot of flexibility on which prayer that you can be able to do because you're you're going to want to be doing these um, a lot. And some of them are maybe. You only want to do once per game, but you really want to do that once per game. So you do it that one turn, and then next turn you you go on to the other prayer that they know. What are the ones that stand out to you the most? Like when do? You, what are the ones that you don't leave home without? All of them. But let's, I mean, let's just go through them, okay? Yeah. I, I I'm I'm deadly serious. You absolutely have a use for all of these. The first one, blood sacrifice, as it all uh, used to be. You pick one of your units. You do D three mortal wounds to them, but you gain a blood tithe. That means top of one, I have one blood tithe and I can do murder lust. Or more importantly, it means that bottom of one, I can do murder lust. So I can now move in their turn because I gained a single blood tithe in my turn, which I did through blood sacrifice. So blood sacrifice is the way that you get a blood tithe to allow you to engage their heavy hitting units in their turn. That's obviously really important. We, we discussed why Murderlust was so good in their turn. You want to be able to guarantee that you can do that. It does have an answer value of four, um, but you put your priest next to the altar. That's re-rollable. You, hopefully, you're playing with mysterious terrain because it's in the rules, and hopefully, you got a mystical, so maybe you can get a three plus. Three plus re-rollable is pretty uh, you know, reliable. Yeah. So blood sacrifice. Yeah, don't leave home without it. Blood cool. bind. So, and obviously as well, I just want to call out as well, like, you know, the extra movement is more than just getting in and avoiding Unleash Hell. Like there's so much opportunity to cap objectives or contest objectives, uh, reposition out of range. Like there's so many benefits that don't just think about, oh, my opponent doesn't have Sentinels or, you know, long strikes. What's the benefit? No, there's a lot of benefits. And I've actually been you said capping objectives, I've been baiting people. So I will deliberately move one of my units off an objective where they've got, say, one one 
they've got one model on objective, I have five. I will move those five off. They will then declare um, gaining momentum because they think that they've got that objective now. Oh, I'm sorry, I've just moved my five models back onto the objective. Now you've got to devote resources to killing them or you fail your battle tactic. You know, this, it, it's just insanely good. That, that's what I wanted to call out. It's more than just avoiding Unleash Hell. Like there's so much interplay and it goes back to what we talked about earlier, which was Corn has a lot of great denying mechanics that maybe on the surface you don't truly appreciate. And yeah. um, when you start to master their army, the, these opportunities start opening up, which creates a fun, dynamic, interactive game that right. an Iron Jaws type of army wouldn't have. Exactly. Um, along those lines, Bloodbind. Pick an enemy unit and move them eight inches towards you. Great. Oh, you think you're so clever, Mr. Sun's player, putting a 30 models or whatever it is on an objective. Sorry, you've got to move eight inches away. Now you're no longer on that objective. You know, we, I can do that in my turn. I mean, sorry, you have to do it in your turn. But great, I can. that means you're no longer on the objective. I just need to move one model on and I've got it. Or, oh, you thought you were so clever. You're out of range of all of my debuff abilities. Not anymore, you're not. I've just moved you closer to me. Um, being able to move your opponent's unit is just great. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Pu pulling people out of their own buff ranges too. If your opponent has like a passive yeah. aura, you know, yep. cool, you pull them out and now they're not wholly within that aura. So yep. lots of good uses of Bloodbind. Yeah. I, I played against uh, uh, Avalor, is that his name? The, yeah, the Stone King, who's got a, a 12 inch minus one to hit. Okay. I just moved him eight inches in the other way. That aura is not hitting anyone anymore. Great. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, bronze Flesh, basically a Mystic Shield, plus one to save rolls. Yeah, I'll take that on my uh, Skull Crushers, please. Then I want a one-up save. And it's, just a th it's just an answer value of three. You can't unbind it. You can't stop it. It's just, you're, you're a yeah. Mystical. That's a two-up. That, that's just so good. Yeah. Uh, Killer Instinct. One of my units can make a normal move in the hero phase. Doesn't prevent you from moving in your movement phase. You're just double movement. Fantastic. We uh, we talked earlier, you asked me, is there a way to threaten your opponent on the top of one? Yes, and this is why. Bloodthirsters now move 12 inches. Put Killer Instinct on them. They've now got a 24-inch movement in the top of one. If you've got that Blood Tithe, you can do Murder Lust. So they've got a 24 plus D6, and then you charge. So 24 inches plus 3D6 threat range, top of one with a boom thirster <laughs> or with Scarbrand, it's what eight plus eight, 16 plus 46. Scarbrand has a, has a 16 plus 46 threat range, top of one. Now you wouldn't want to put him in top of one because he's still not angry, but you get the idea. Um, you can, you can project power by moving in the hero phase. As we said, anything that allows you to move outside of the movement phase is strong. And this is just a three up prayer that does it. And it goes back to making your opponent with a tough decision because let's go back to the shooting armies because that's the that's the thing that like has always gotten to corn in the past you know shooting heavy armies stormcast daughters you know anyone that has volume uh, sentinels we talked earlier about I don't I don't want to keep bringing up sentinels but like there's lots of different builds of shooting if you're a one drop and traditionally as you've already said they give it to you first you move up the board cool then they get to shoot you because you're in range if they're lucky they get a double turn they shoot you off even more now you've got a real serious threat as a as a shooting opponent a do i give it to you and know that i can get into combat without any of my buffs or b mm -hmm. Do I take the turn knowing that my first movement phase or my, my first shooting phase, nothing's going to really be in range, and you now get the potential double turn between turn one to turn two? Yep. You've asked a real tough question now. Right. And, and you can use it either to send in your boom thirst or you know, whatever you want, your, your deadly piece, or they think they were clever moving out of range of your... Uh, Skull Crushers, well, your Skull Crushers are now moving 16 rather than 8 because they're moving in the hero phase. And then you, yeah, you auto run them 6, so they've got a 22-inch range, and then you, in their hero phase, move them into combat. Yeah. Awesome. It's wild. It's wild. Unholy Flames. The weakness of corn has always been a lack of rend, or since 3.0 came out and save stacking. 
to some extent that's still true they have increased the rend particularly on the mortal units a little bit but bloodthirsters are still rend two scarred rend still rend two well you can just give somebody rend three you yeah, know just plus one great right plus one rend is always good right uh and yeah this is yeah it's on a four plus but again mystical it's a three plus next year old to it's re-rollable great and then the last one i mean which main curse is the one that maybe you don't take in your starting army because it's situational but you would summon a unit and give it this and that's um pick an enemy wizard anywhere on the board as long as it's visible no range and then until your next hero phase they're minus one to cast and if they fail to cast, either you unbind it or they um, fail it, then they suffer D3 mortal wounds. Great. This is where the uh, the pair with the Saigor. Saigor's got an ability that if they successfully cast a spell, they suffer a mortal wound. So pair it with this. If you do cast, you're suffering one. If you don't cast, you're suffering D3. Great. You know. Uh, and then Saigor, the Saigor has like a range of 30, so it's very yes. generous. Yes. Yeah, and he's got a fairly big base. So um, yeah, you're playing against Gits players who've got all of these two cast, five wound wizards. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, two I casts, that's so either two mortal wounds, so two fifths of your um, thing, or two D3. You know, it, it's crazy good. I'd say the first thing I thought about, Marathi. What a great yeah. way to put three wounds on Marathi before they've even started combat. Because Marathi always, to do, always, always wants to do Mind Razor. Always mm -hmm. wants to do a couple of those spells. And Mind Razor is not particularly easy to get off. It puts, you know, even if it does nothing, it's putting doubt in their mind and thinking, do I really want to cast this spell? If I do, I suffer one mortal wound. If I don't, I suffer D3. It's great. If the next general's handbook goes into like a magic, because obviously we've gone through, you know, monsters, we've gone through heroes, we've gone through troops. I can't see them moving into like a cavalry because not everyone has cavalry, yep. but if they went to like a magic type of like meta, imagine having Witchbane Curse. That's a, definitely a spell you would have up your sleeve at a tournament because now a, a prayer, sorry, a prayer. Heresy. Heresy. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about killing all the priests. The, 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 the wizards. Ah, you're confusing me. Um, but like everyone's going to take a lot of those small little wizards, right? It's how you yep. get maximum wizard benefits. Having Witchbane Curse will just... That's well, how even you on, five yeah, you're against Lumineth, just put it on some Sentinels. Make it more difficult for them to get Lambert Light. Is that what it is? Um, yeah, the, whatever their spell is that gives them mortals on fives. Make it A, more difficult, and just put that doubt in their mind. Hey, if you fail to cast it, D3 of your Sentinels are dying. Yeah, Great. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. So I think, I think you, as you've mentioned, five out of the six would definitely be potential must includes. Uh, they're all really good. Which Bane Curse might be a little bit more situational. Um, but you've got so many great priest options that um, you're going to be able to put them in your list. I guess it depends on how you build the list, what's important to you, and um, how you see your army playing out will depend yep. on what, what's more valuable. Yep. What's your favorites of the command trait? So each of the sides has four. So you've got four for your uh, Blades of Corn Demons. You've got four for your Bloodbound Generals. If you were going to pick Demons, uh, assuming uh, avoiding General's Handbook ones, let's, or the Universal ones, sure. um, what what stands out to you? Well, this one's interesting. That um, I think there's clearly, the Demon ones are clearly better than the Mortal ones here. Maybe I'm biased, but I look at the Demon ones and I think... Um, all of these are good. Um, if you're, there are definitely builds that spam blood letters. So you take that first one, embodiment of wrath, and then on two plus for each blood letter unit, not just choose one for every blood letter unit that is within 16 of you, wholly within on a two plus, you can return D3. Yeah. Blood letters are now on two wounds. So returning mm. D, D3 two wound models to every single blood letter unit you have. Yeah. Why not? um so i can absolutely see you taking that um favored by corn this is probably the least strong but just start the battle with one blood tithe rather than taking blood sacrifice and risking it just say yep yeah, i'll have one thank you uh five round this is my personal favorite uh just turn a bloodthirster into a priest yep you know uh, like again bloodthirsters are on rend two turn him into a priest it doesn't matter where he's going then he's shooting off a board doing his own thing every hero phase he can give himself plus one rend great 
Qu question for you. Would you, because one of the challenges with curse is always the, the short range and having a priest that wants to get in that short range. Would you consider putting curse on a bloodthirster that's a, that's a priest? No. Um, I think if you're going, you know, a bloodthirster himself doesn't need curse because he doesn't have a lot of attacks. I mean, the fury and the wrath have eight attacks. It's not worth it, right, to do that. Uh, if you're going to put it on a unit hoping that blood letters go in, well, blood letters are already doing mortals on sixes. So um, maybe not. If you're going mortal heavy, then maybe. And yeah, bloodthirsters are fast, so they can keep up and they can get the range to do that. I'm still not sure that I would, though. Um, I, I think there are better, as we just saw. Our prayers are so good that I don't know if I would do that. Um, I think there are some plays where you take curse, but not on a bloodthirster. I think maybe yeah. on the uh, the herald on chariot, because um, he's fast as well. He can keep up with the mortal units to do it. Yeah, and it's not obviously not costing you um, a, a, a general trait to make them exactly. a priest because it's already right. a priest. Right. Um, and then unrelenting hunter again movement in your opponent's turn or your turn. It's just at the end of the combat phase, so either of them. If your general fought, and if he's a bloodthirster, great. Um, he can make a, a pile-in move if he's within three, and if he's not within three, he can make a normal move. So again, if it's a bloodthirster, 12-inch movement at every combat phase, yeah, great. <laughs> Just awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, the, uh, it's sort of like the ability that Furies have, and Furies are, are great for this. You Just in the combat phase, moving in the combat phase means that you can take objectives that your opponent wasn't expecting you to take. And again, I, I keep talking about bloodthirsters because my blood, my general's always a bloodthirster. Um, but 12-inch move with fly at the end of the combat phase. Yes, you have to not be in combat, but hopefully your bloodthirster's done his job and he's killed whatever he went into. Then he can move another 12 inches. Great. And the same and the same theory is true if you wanted to put the uh the Herald of Corn on Blood Throne. If you were running more of a blood letter type of list, that same theory, yes, it's not as killy, but you could be using that speed and the the skills to be able to do that in a, in a different way. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you, by the way. Flav Favorite of Corn was the one I least liked. Um, I just didn't think it was worth a command trait for one blood tie. Um, I agree. Obviously, embodiment, embodiment is great if you're doing blood letters, but um, I think to me, making a demon priest, especially a thirster, was the one that screamed out to me the most. Yeah, but I think I would rank them Firebrand first, Unrelenting Hunter a close second, Embodiment if you're doing the Bloodletter spam and then Favor by Corn. Again, yeah. just uh, movement when your opponent's not expecting you to move is great. It's, it's always good. Agreed. Uh, this, this, game, this game is about movement. It's not always about killing. In fact, yeah. a lot of people who win are playing the movement game. Yeah. But the uh, other side. Mortals, add one to the damage characteristic of attacks made if that target is an enemy hero. Useless. A lot of the mortal heroes are useless in combat, and this it's only against heroes. Yeah, not good. Maybe um, maybe like the, the... Is it the Mighty Lord on Juggernaut? Maybe. Maybe, but... but yeah, no. Uh, add one, one to run and charge rolls uh, for Blood Reavers... Claws and flesh hounds. Sure. Um, why not? You know, plus one to run and charge for reavers and flesh hounds. It's fine. Um, what, what about, what more, about the, reavers, the reavers span? Like we just talked about a list that was viable with running like 70 reavers or 80 reavers. If you flood the board with, with reavers and you're trying to get those five up mortals, that might not be, that might not be a bad build for that particular style, but, yeah, I agree. In most lists where you might only run a couple of Blood Reavers at best, I, I wouldn't yeah. be going I, I, one to run I, a charge. I think that one is probably the strongest of the mortal command traits, but it's it doesn't compare to Firebrand or Unrelenting Hunter. Um, the Lord, Lord of the Gore Chosen, you know, you say, oh, you read, add one to the attacks characteristic. That's fantastic. Only to Gore Chosen units. Gore Chosen units are useless, so... 
not good. And then high priest, great. You can chant an extra prayer. We've all already been through. Prayers are good. So yeah, um, if you have a slaughter priest and he's your general or a ritualist, um, then yeah, high priest is fine. But personally, I'm sticking to the demon side for the command traits. High priest was my high. If you're going to choose a, a, a bloodbound general, high priest was the one that I went. Yep. Just again, you have so many great prayers, especially if you double down, get an enhancement of getting extra prayers. That just makes complete sense to me. It does mean though that your target your general is going to be targeted. It's probably a five or a six wound idiot, but um, I, I think the benefits outweigh that. Yeah. Um. Yes, it is. But you know, if he's a priest, he's probably staying at the back, and you know. If they want to target him with some shooting, you particularly this season, you can just say no, you're not targeting him with him with shooting. You can hide him behind the altar. The sword of priest is kind of small. Uh, the ritualist, if you trim off the uh, top of his staff, the uh, ritualist is small. You, they can hide behind an altar pretty easily. Um, yeah, so you, oh. you can protect them. Oh, we put, we put the stuff that way. It's like it's about to hit yeah. the the uh, tactical <laughs> rock. Don't do that. I was kidding. Um, Artifacts, I kind of have the same feeling. I, I think the demon side is better. Um, the demon side, you know, the of four at ward against mortals, yeah. I mean, it's always nice to be able to keep your bloodthirster alive a bit longer. Um, they do have a weakness against mortals, but you already have that five at ward against everything if you're more than eight inches away, so you're already surviving that first turn. And after that, doesn't matter as much. So that one's, it's okay. But I wouldn't take it. Uh, Argath ward rolls cannot be made for enemy units while they were within three. Great, fantastic. Uh, there are a lot of armies now that have wards. Um, so yeah, you could get unlucky and go a five round tournament and not face any army where this comes into play. Uh, so, but particularly if you're going, you know, you have a friendly game coming up and it's against Fire Slayers or Nurgle or something. Sure, why not? Uh, Halo and Blood it, Strike first. Sorry, uh, if I if, if I just just one quick call out, you know, when at the time of recording, we now know the two death books are going to be um, Soul Blight and Ossiarch Bone Reapers. So if that gets popular in the meta, in addition to Nurgle, in addition to Fire Slayers, who knows what happens to Cities of Sigma with like Phoenix Guard and like if you find yourself in a meta that's heavy with wards, it's great. Nighthaunt, yep. for example, but if you find yourself in, like, I do find while it sounds really good, a lot of the times you also fight against armies that don't have a ward, or it might be a hero with a ward. It's like it's too hard to get to. So it can be a situational choice depending on the meta. I think if you're going for the double artifact, so you decide you don't want the double prayer, you want the double artifact instead. I think it's a it's a great second choice artifact. Yes. Yeah. Um, Particularly, you know, when we come onto the Fury Thurster, you can absolutely use a Fury Thurster as a upfront support piece, and so he's now got an additional aura that is turning off wards. Just put him behind your pieces that are actually attacking, and yeah, it, it can be useful. But it's Halo of Blood that's the one that stands out to me. Yeah, it's strike like... first. Uh, put it on a Boom Thurster or, or any of the Thursters really, and just um, well, actually, put it on a, a Blood Thurster. And you get charged, you're still fighting first. Great. There's also um put it on a blood master or uh a blood master. One of the heralds has a thing that allows blood letters to fight immediately after him. So yes. now he's fighting first and your blood letters are fighting first. Great. Yeah. Love I'll, that. I'll give something that allows my blood letters to strike first. Yeah, I'll take that. Um Skull shard, Marth, Skull shard mantle, yeah, that's too situational. I'm not, I'm not taking that. Well, maybe if it's like my third artifact, if I had three. Um, on the Bloodbound side, the one that kind of stood out to me, and there wasn't a lot that stood out to me, it was like Banner of Blood, because I would probably yep. have a Blood Secretor in my list. Yep. Uh, 16 inch is generous as a uh, an area, and the reroll charge is something that I would want, and it's not locked to bloodbound. It's actually yeah. for everyone. So to me, that was the one that was just a clear winner. A hundred percent agree. Yeah, the, the others are all yeah. But, uh, what's, what's the other one? Like uh, then a combat does some wounds to a hero or a monster. It does a blood tie. Uh, yeah, you know the, the 
the mortal heroes are so eh in combat that it's just and it's again only against a hero or a monster just not worth it uh, I mean, the, I mean, the Crimson Plate it might be okay as well. It, it's like if you find yourself in again, you might have that mighty juggernaut or corn. You can't, you know, you're going to be within eight, so you you want a ward, might be worthy. Um, you wouldn't have but, a ward anyway because it's demons only. So um. of course, of course, yes, of course. So again, like there you go, the Crimson Plate actually might work quite yeah. nicely. But yeah, I think the Banner of Blood stands out to me as the ultimate artifact in the Bloodbound list. Agree, agree. Slaughter hosts. So you've got six. Are they all yep. equal? Are they all equal? Are some better than others? And what are the ones that stand out to you? Or you can take this however you want to take it. Uh, they're not all equal, but they're not. There, there aren't any that are really terrible. Um, for me, I'm going to be playing Bloodless, Bloodthirster spam. I'm going Reapers of Vengeance always. Uh, one, because it's, I've always played Reapers of Vengeance, so I'm going to continue to do that. But Plus one for um, to hit rolls if you target an enemy hero. When we come on to the uh, the boom thirster, that's going to be really important. But also every time an enemy hero is slain, you receive another blood tithe, and it's not in combat. It's just whenever they die. Um, if enemy wizard decides to miscast and kill himself, thank you. That's two blood tithe. Uh, yeah, really, really useful. Can, can I just pause on one second there? Because I've seen a few comments in my preview video that people were upset that the Bloodthirster's base attack characteristic was a four up to hit. And I can the see on the... Yeah. yeah, like the Boom Thirst is like a four up. And I can see why people would be upset at the surface. But when you apply Reapers of Vengeance, uh, it makes it a three up, right? If you had a base characteristic of three and then Reapers of Vengeance and all out attack or or all out attack came in, bringing it down to two, I feel like the points that you pay for a Bloodthirster would be now around the 500 mark. And maybe that's probably not the army they want. I don't know. Like to, to me, when you add Reapers of Vengeance and you go from three to two, that's too good. Yes. Um, so it was interesting in the old book i tended to use my boom thirster as a horde clearing um monster you know, double activation he's got 10 attacks d6 damage it can clear hordes and then you're going to get two or three booms which may be kill off some support heroes in the back that that's gone the boom thirster is now a hero hunting monster and so yeah i, I tend to agree um I think I'd be okay with a Boom Thurster being 500 points, hitting on threes and having seven attacks, say. Um, I, I would personally prefer that because, yeah, we've lost the reroll once. He used to hit on fours, rerolling ones. Now he's hitting on fours without the reroll. That, that's quite a big difference. Um, but yeah, you can, you can put him down to threes to hit with Reapers or... You know, previously you would never get to use all out attack on a boom thirster because you were spending the command point to double activate him instead yes. now you've got nothing else to spend the command points on so you can often all out attack you can't be roared so you know all out attack is generally going to be used to get him to hit on threes uh, but yeah i mean the, just the, the plus one to hit is great and it also goes on to your um flesh hounds mm. Two units of flesh hounds going into a support hero. That's 40 attacks hitting on twos. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Re Reapers is great. Um, there's a couple of other good ones. There's some of them, some of them I'm, I'm not so much. Like, for example, the flayed was like, uh, I don't really know if I want. That almost feels like counterintuitive, like the flayed bloodbound getting a ward of five up if they've been picked to fight. But then I also want them to die and do mortals back. But I also want the blood tie, like, which is why I want them can, to die. I don't you know. Like definitely, uh, again, if the eighteen skull crusher list that you mentioned take the flayed every single time, yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> give them a five at ward. Yes, not all of them get a five at ward, and you're playing some activation wars. But again, that's causing your opponent to think: Do I want to fight or not? You know, or do I? So, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think the flayed definitely has played. Uh, Gortide has um, some benefits, you know, plus one to wound if they're on an objective. That can sometimes come in. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, Bloodlords is fantastic if you're doing Bloodletter Spam. 
it's interesting you talk about the flayed. Just to go back to the flayed for a second, maybe the reason I was thinking about the flayed uh, is probably because I'm comparing it to Skullfiend Tribe, where if I'm running, let's say, the eight mighty skull crushers, I probably would feel like I'd want the Skullfiend Tribe for that list over the flayed. Like I'd rather try to get a lot of strike first on that as opposed to just double down on their durability. But I mean, if if you're going for the durability of skull crushers, then you're not charging them in. You're using murderless to get in in their hero phase. In which case, Skullfiend never does anything because you're not charging. Um, so, I think I, I definitely see the Flayed being one of the more popular mortal uh, slaughter hosts to take. Okay. Okay. Um, and then again, if you're doing blood letter spam, which I think is a very viable list, blood lords, you know, just rather than doing mortals on sixes to hit, you're now doing mortals on fives to hit. And I think there's actually there's some play with taking curse in blood lords, which is kind of weird. But with if you've got blood letter spam, they do mortals on sixes normally, but the attack sequence ends. Mm. If with blood lords they do mortals on five and sixes, and the attack sequence ends. If you put curse on the enemy unit, you're suddenly doing mortals on fives, the attack sequence ends, mortals on sixes, the attack sequence doesn't end. <laughs> Which so you so you get a little bit more use out of curse in Blood Lords with Blood Ladder Spam. Okay. There's um, some, some interesting source there. <laughs> I don't think it's particularly impressive, but I bet somebody will use it. It's very situational and a lot of setup, but like yeah. you'll you'll when you when you pull it off, you'll be happy with that. Yeah. Um. So I I would say Reapers and Blood Lords are my two favorite. If I'm going Mortals, I'm probably taking the Flayed. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I prefer Skullfiend Tribe. I like the idea of of them charging in, striking first. The challenge is though, when you look at their profile, their profile isn't that hot. But obviously, if you put the prayer for the additional rend, um. If you can pull off a bunch of charges, um, it's an eight plus though. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll give you that one. Like it is an eight plus, so you're probably hitting it what sixty percent of the time. Don't quote me, maths people, but um, it's yeah, like it's that. it's it's not reliable. Sorry, yeah, forty percent. Sorry, forty yeah. percent. Uh, that's um, so sorry. I'm, I'm going the wrong way, but it, it's it's a sub faction ability. That is use that you get to use forty percent of the time that you make a charge. How many times in the game are you making a charge with a unit? You know, so most units will charge once, maybe twice in a game, and then there's a forty percent chance that it actually does something when they do that charge. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll pay you that, and then that might bring in the crimson, um, the crimson armor or whatever it was for the five up ward for a hero. So that might be a support piece for you too. So mm -hmm. yeah, you could absolutely build. I'm not saying it's not viable. I just think my preference would be uh, ABC, mate. Always be charging. Always be charging. Sure. ABC. Um, Grand Strats. <laughs> uh, no, man, I'm a destruction player. I run <laughs> last book, it would be never be charging. I didn't make a single charge last book. Always be charging. My okay. take on the grand strategies was I don't like any of them. Yep, and in fact, trash. I would go General's Handbook. Do you yep. agree? A hundred percent. You will never use any of these grand strategies. Why? I'd love to hear from you why. Why would you not pick these compared to your grand and your your General's Handbook ones? Um, and then maybe the second part was, let's say you go to a tournament and they force you to take uh, book tactics or book grand strats only. And I forced you to take one. What one would it be? That would be an interesting take for a TO. Um, okay, so let's go through them quickly. The first one, you have to summon a corn Demon unit every round after the first. So that means I have to guarantee that I have three Blood Tithe at least in every single round. Yes. You know, I'm generating three Blood Tithe in every single round. And you're not spending it on the other and table. You're not, like, not spending it on anything else. Or not even I'm not spending it on the table. I'm not spending it all. Like maybe I want to spend five points this round, this turn to summon a cannon or a herald or some blood letters or something. Well, now that means I'm back to zero and I've got to start. I've got to guarantee that I get three before my turn next turn. That's that's really difficult, you know. Particularly if you get a double, you know, you spend it all in the bottom of turn two. 
the top of three, you've got to somehow generate three blood ties before your movement phase. It's just not going to happen. Well, it's also like also you got to think about the fact that as the the game kind of gets through a, a point of attrition and like turn four, turn five, there really yep. isn't a lot left. You're going to need to have a minimum of six blood tithe points up your sleeve for turn yep. four to turn five to summon the minimum. And assuming there's not a lot of magic being thrown around and it's only one in every three, you deflect and get a blood tithe point. Um, there's not a lot of units to kill. So it's very much what's that? You would need a minimum of 12 blood tithe to spend throughout those four rounds. Yep. That's four times three. Yeah. No, thank you. So not doing that one. Um, at the start, the next one, at the start of the first battle round, your opponent picks one hero from their army. You get the grand strategy. If that hero is killed and your general has been slain. No, it doesn't even say on the table. If they've you know got a um, a hero that can deep strike, so and they just keep him off the table for the first three turns, that means you've only got rounds four and five to kill him. And you've got to keep your general alive. Yeah, useless. No thanks. I, I would I would run that at my local game store, but I wouldn't commit to this at a tournament. Yes. Yeah, that's It'd be fun as all hell. It'd be fun as all hell at my local store. Yeah, I 100% right? agree with that. But yeah, in a tournament, you just... No, thank you. There's no way you can guarantee that you've got a chance of doing that one. Um, or, you know, you come across an army where they've only got one hero and it's Archeon. Yeah, thanks. Um, or not even they've only got one hero because they can choose. If I could choose, then I'd be thinking about it, but they get to choose. So yeah, they choose Archeon or they choose Mr. Tank. You know, just not going to happen. Hmm. Uh, the next one, you've got to spend Blood Tithe in every battle round, okay, I, I'm I'm going to do that, so I'm happy with that from the table. But you're not allowed to use the same blood tithe more than once. I want to use murder lust every single round. Thank you very much. So this is just hamstringing yourself. No chance. And then, <laughs> disciples of carnage. You get this if you complete four battle tactics, and every battle tactic is from the corn battle tactics. Ah. Uh, yeah, the, the, the corn battle tactics are good. We'll come on to that. But there's no way you can guarantee that you're going to get four of them every game. Just no maybe, chance. Maybe you take that one if you play in a tournament that forces you to do battle tactics from your book only. But <laughs> otherwise, but otherwise yes. it's like, I don't, I don't want to get in a situation where I'm at the table, it's the thick of the battle, and I could choose either something from my general's handbook that will deny my grand strategy or I have to play one that I could lose, or I'm not as confident scoring, just in an attempt to try to score my grand. It's just I don't like those situations where I'm fighting against myself. Can I just say I'm fully on board with this pushback against TOs that ban book tactics and grand strategies? We're going to start having tournaments that only allow book battle tactics and grand strategies. Great, I'm, I'm coming. Look, uh, look, I'm I'm just thinking of a world where we, everyone has their own grand strategies and battle tactics. Maybe who knows? Who knows what that world is? But right yeah. now, that's not the world we live in, so we don't have to pick disciples of carnage. Right. Okay, the battle tactics these do have play, and you will be using one or two of these in a, a game probably. Um, Blood for the altar. Pick a unit that's within eight of your skull altar, not wholly within, just within eight, and destroy that unit. Yeah, at some point in the game, there will be some unit near your altar that you think, yeah, I can kill that. Um, so, yeah, yes, okay. I'll take that often. Especially if, as you said earlier, if you put your uh, skull altar aggressively. So if yes. you play it defensively, yeah, probably don't pick that one, but or at least situationally, right? But if you are someone who's doing it aggressively, who wants mm -hmm. the, you know, the benefits to prayers, then blood for the altar. And you, maybe that's another reason you want to put it aggressively. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally try to put my altar as close to the middle objective, whatever that may mean on the battle plan as possible, so that I can summon onto that objective. But then, yes, it does also mean that when you're fighting over that middle objective, there will be enemy units that are within eight, and you can just pink one off and get a, a battle tactic. Um, slay the sorcerer, pick an enemy wizard. Um, yeah, I just mean, yeah, okay. I, I just recognize. Yeah, <laughs> I, just rec uh, I just realized that. Pick an enemy wizard, kill it. Um, again, you know, a lot of wizards are five wounds, six wounds, idiots. Um, 
you know, you can, particularly if you've managed to get off the uh, Witchbane and they've already taken four or five more uh, more wounds and they've only got one or two left, then sure, you can you can do something to kill it, even if it's at the back of the board. Um, a couple of times I've chosen that and then I've used the three blood tithe to do mortal wounds to an enemy unit on the board. Uh, just to, you know, they've got three wounds left. Okay, roll eight dice every five plus is a mortal wound. Easy battle tactic done. Valkyar, you were safe at the back there. Yeah. Pig Valkyar, nice little yeah, speed well, of the face. We, have, as we well. have lots of options. You know, or yeah. again, summon that skull cannon. Four shots, D3 damage. Yeah. Um, Trial of Skulls, uh, kill eight enemy models by the same one of your units. I often pick that one. Probably not as frequently now as I used to in the old book, but again, you're going against... Um, your, your plan is to send Scarbrand into some unit of one wound models. Yeah, he's going to kill eight of them, yeah, guaranteed. He's doing a minimum of eight mortal wounds to begin with. So yeah, that, that's generally doable. If you're going against Suns, no. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Gears, it's situational. Beast of, chaos, beast of yeah. chaos, Gates, Zombies, like, and uh, with, with Glacian Champions disappearing now. Um, sorry, Glacian Veterans disappeared. Um, like people are bringing more reinforced yep. units now. So a few so weeks hard. ago, yeah, this was in the old book and a few weeks ago at a tournament when I was playing the old book, I was against Gitz and I picked this with my boom thirster and he killed 64 models that turn. So yes, I got the uh, battle <laughs> tactic. <laughs> just, just, just yeah, as risky. Yes. It's a risky, risky play. Yeah, it was risky. Just not there. Yeah. Um, I like this one, No Cowards Among Us. All of your units have to be within eight of an enemy unit. Obviously, you're not taking that turn one, but by the end of the game where you're down to two units left or something, sure. You're often at the end of the game, it's difficult to get battle tactics. This one actually becomes easier as the game goes on and you have fewer and fewer units. Um, particularly, you know, oh, oh, I've only got a... Um, you know, I've got a priest left who's at the back. Well, what do you know? He's got the uh, move in the hero phase prayer, so I'm going to move him twice and then run and yes now he's within eight inches of an enemy unit so, so that one's pretty good yeah um leave none standing this one is my least favorite but again can be done pick an enemy unit that's within three you have to fight with your unit and at the end he has to have no enemy units within three yeah it's doable you know i i picked it this morning um, against somebody, but they, and I killed the unit I was in combat in with. So I was like, great, I got my battle tactic, but then he piled in another unit to get within three of me. And I was like, ah, oh. so yeah, um, fine. And then the battlefield runs red, four more units destroyed during this turn. Yeah, I love it. I, I, I often take that one just for fun. It's like a, a game last weekend, I charged three units of flesh hounds into a unit of enemy dragons. Yeah, my flesh hands died, but I got the battle tactic. Because um, it's that it's four units from either side. It doesn't have to be your opponent's yeah. units. It's just you can sacrifice. Again, if you're playing MSU Mortals, yeah, just send off four units of 10 Reavers to die. Sure. That sounds like a great turn three battle tactic, assuming you're yeah. in the thick of it. You know, to yeah, like exactly. your attrition's kicked in. You got a couple of here and there. That's, yeah. a, that's a great one. Yeah, it absolutely is. Quick thoughts. So, yeah, I, I think on... the battle tactics have play. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, a couple of situational ones, but the one that I wanted to really just quickly get to before we get to the realm scourge ritualist is that battalion. Now, I thought it was a bit restrictive. Five gore chosen units. I thought that was a bit much, especially as you can go up to eight. Um, and I didn't think the benefits were as worth it compared to taking the five. Um, now, you know, if it was three, I'd probably be on board. I thought five was too much. I don't know. What are your thoughts on the battalion? It's useless. It's never going to be taken. So let's be clear. Gore chosen is a key word. And the only units that have that are some of the mortal heroes. Yes. None of the mortal standard units have it. It's only heroes. So like the fact that you can take up to eight, well, Great, but in the 2,000-point General's Handbook list, you can only take six heroes, so you're never taking eight. Um, so I, you're going to have five 
the gore chosen heroes are generally bad. The only good ones are the slaughter priest and the rich list. Uh, maybe the mighty lord of corn. Taking five is it's really going to hamper you. I, but, I went. To, go on, sorry. I, I, your take. If it was three, then it would be too powerful. Because yeah, I'll take two slaughter priests and a rich list, say, and get myself an extra prayer. Um, I will say, if some of those gore chosen were like, is it the Doom Seeker in Fire Slayers that are like a hero, but it's not a hero? Mm -hmm. um, if if you had a couple of those within gore chosen, yes, I, I'm on board. I'm on board because I want to run a couple of those, like just absolute kamikaze, not quite a hero, but independent threats. I just thought it was too restrictive, my my opinion. And it's a shame that there are like the the Deathbringers, the aspiring Deathbringer and the Exalted Deathbringer. They're useless. They're just absolutely useless. If they weren't heroes, then yeah. you would actually take some play. Yeah. And it, it wouldn't it wouldn't drastically change the book if they weren't heroes. You know? you, yeah, well, having six heroes plus an ex uh, Exalted Deathbringer, fine. You know, it doesn't. It's not broken. Yeah, drop drop the drop the leader uh, battlefield requirement yes. and make them just hero keyword like got yes, trek like I mean, other yes. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we're we're right. we're on the same page. Like Kalanak out. has that, but he's not gore chosen because he's a demon. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like you can't. Bef before the, we go into the rituals, can we talk about what we're missing? All right, all right. We'll go back one. So we've just covered all of the army allegiance abilities. Extremely disappointing that we don't have army-specific command abilities. They're getting rid of those in general, so that's fine. But no heroic actions, and big take, no monstrous rampages. I was fully expecting for there to be some monstrous rampage for Bloodthirsters, but there isn't. And I, I was quite disappointed by that because, but again, if you're running three Bloodthirsters, which I usually do, one of them does stomp. One of them does roll. What's the other one going to do? Maybe Titanic Duel if he's up against an enemy monster, but enemy monsters are not as common now in this season. So there's you're often running out of monstrous rampages to do. It would have been really nice if there was something flavorable, flavorful for corn to do. Um, you know, if, even if it's just D6 mortals against a wizard only, you know, just something just to add a bit more flavor to it. I, I was surprised there weren't monstrous rampages and, and disappointed. Yeah, I, I I probably was a little bit surprised as well that it wasn't at least tied to any of the slaughter hosts. Um, and, you know, you could have played into that space because, like, as a Suns player, I love the ability to wrestle and, and suplex mm -hmm. uh, a, a, an enemy monster. As a Gitz player, I love the boing. I love being able to charge in and then boing another 3D6 after the charge, yep. right? Uh, so that, nice. That's... We we play in that space. Like I know corn is a bit more techy than you know us simple destruction players, but we have some of that that love of monsters. And yeah, I probably would have liked to have seen something where even if it was something very specific, like a a different version of Titanic Jewel, you know, something yeah, that's something. I, I think um you know, bloodthirsters are iconic for corn when at least for me and probably for a lot of people when they think of corn they think of bloodthirsters maybe more so than zinch thinks of lord of change or slash thinks of keeper of secrets um you know bloodthirsters are, are pretty big in the game and it's a shame that they don't get something special to do i i can only imagine that they wanted to again internal balance and you know um, yep. gw's talked about this a lot i can only imagine that if they had that then that bloodthirster build remains the popular build and maybe they don't achieve their goals. But long story short, I agree with you. I agree wholeheartedly. I was surprised to at least not see a monstrous rampage. Yep. Okay. You, you had your piece, which, yes. but, but I, but I agree with you. I do. I genuinely do agree because bloodthirster, if I was going to be a corn player, um, the bloodthirster heavy build is where I would start. It's yep. what I would want to run. And um, yeah, it's just not there. But what is there is a tactical rock and the realm <laughs> ritualist. Um, so this person's yep. going to be picking up their rock and moving it up the board as they move around. Um, it's cheap. It's a priest. It's a hundred points. Um, it's not going to do a lot in damage. I mean, like if it doesn't, if it gets into combat, that's a, 
uh, it's a it's a, a gambling profile three threes ren two for d6 so if it spikes you're gonna hit the hear the the, the noises in the casino but you don't take it for the the weapon profile you take it for its two abilities what's yes. your thoughts what's your thoughts so i mean i went out and bought one i've built it this morning so yeah i've got one um i think uh Yes. So first of all, yes, you're not taking it for its combat ability. Although I will say that I've used one in a few games and the opponents are surprised when they charge in and they think, oh, I don't have to attack him first because, you know, I'll, I'll attack somewhere else first. And then you swing back and they're like, yeah, threes and threes minus two D6 is, is a surprise. Um, yeah. The, but yeah, you're taking it for its abilities. Uh, the first one... Yeah, you know, I don't play mortals, so the desecrating blood runes is not doing anything for me. But if you're taking mortals, then yeah, you pick that center objective. Yeah, you, know, you particularly in this um, GHB where the typical turn one uh, battle tactic is cunning maneuver, where you need to get one of your GCs onto an objective outside your territory, so you can prayer to move him. Um, and then you can move him. You can get that objective outside your territory, maybe the center one, and then you use his ability to make sure that all of your uh, units have plus one to hit for the rest of the game on that objective. That's pretty strong. Um, Especially because at the moment, the battle plans have less objectives than previous editions. Yep. So um, you got a lot more choices. So, uh, and obviously you got some of them where you might only be like two of them. So, pick a home objective, defend it, and you're getting plus one to hit, or you, you know, you, you're going for someone's someone's objective. Uh, it just makes it a lot easier to, to score it. Yeah. Uh, Blood Hex is prayer. So he's a priest. She's a priest. I can't tell whether it's a man or a woman. Um, I imagine those, those legs are definitely a female, but... Uh, who am I to judge? Maybe you yeah. have slender legs. Uh, mine, mine are thick. <laughs> I'm I'm thick. Uh, my legs don't look like that. Uh, so subtract one to attacks characteristic. That's insanely good. You know, how many units have, you know, they're spamming three or four attacks each? Well, not anymore. Or even like, if a unit is a spamming two attacks each, you are halving the number of attacks that are coming at you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's a fantastic prayer. But we've already said all of the, the prayer law prayers are good as well. So it's a priest that already has an awesome prayer on its scroll and will know one of the ones from your scripture or whatever it's called. So yeah, it's a great unit and it's cheaper than a sword of priest. So why not? Yeah. I was going to say how much are the others, the, the other priests, if you put your priests, uh, sword of priest is 110. The 110. blood master is a hundred. And then the herald on throne is 160. Maybe I can't remember. Yeah, the Blood Throne is 160. Obviously, you can't compare this to a Blood Throne priest, but if you find no. yourself looking for a priest and you're running out of points or uh, like you, you are running the Bloodbound and, you know, you can take advantage of the Desecrating uh, Blood, would you, as a demon-focused player, run this? Yes, I bought one. I've, had, I've got one in all of my lists. Um, I will say that... At first, I thought I'm just going to drop my slaughter priests because and just take ritualists instead. But this guy doesn't unbind. Slaughter priests can still unbind enemy magic. The ritualists cannot. So mm. uh, there's still a reason to take a slaughter priest over this. That it is ten points more, but you get an unbind. It's worth it. So I'm taking one of each in a lot of my lists, and then I'm summoning the demon uh, priests would you take two or do you see a world where you would take two ritualists i think if you're going um mortal heavy list yes uh for two reasons one a lot of the mortal heroes are crap so you're not wasting a hero spot with this guy um and yeah as you said getting plus one to hit on two objectives is awesome so why not yeah yeah is, is is it not a hero? No, it is a hero, but you don't care about it taking up a hero spot. Ah, uh, right. I was trying. In, in, in my in my demon list, I've already you know I've got three bloodthirsters, which are three heroes plus a slaughter priest. That's four. If I take two of these, then I don't have some of the other heroes that I like. So, um, yeah, in a mortal yeah. list, you don't care as much. 
I, I could see a specific world where uh, you might want to get like have a couple of options, but yeah, I, pro- I think one's probably enough in most lists. Yeah, but uh, give it a try. I think the blood hex is decent. Blood sec- the desecrating blood runes is good, uh, especially if you are blood bound. But hey, uh, she is blood bound, so even if it was just to protect your own uh, your own objective. Um, and you know you, you got the skull altar around it could be a great way to use that that yeah this option so, so she's hitting on twos instead of threes <laughs> correct correct and not costing you a cp to do it twos threes defending yeah. that skull altar that's yeah, um great that's that's so good so it kind of leads us into two of your lists so as always uh people this is not the the internet list not everyone has to go out and buy all these units and this is the one true way um it's definitely one one example of a, of a list and obviously yeah, FAQ erratas to come. Hopefully nothing nothing really here stands out to me that needs erratas. But what I want to what I'd love to hear from you is what's the list all about and and how does it work? Just for anyone who's listening to us on audio, uh, it's a Reapers of Vengeance list. Take what's theirs is the uh, the grand I'm strategy sure. and uh, bloodthirsty is the triumph. You've got a bloodthirster of uh, insensate rage, which is the general halo for the first strike. Fire for the pre, uh, the fire brand making it a priest. I just rec- I just realized you put little um, notes in there for me. I love it. Um, <laughs> you got the killer instinct for the hero phase move. You got unholy flames for the additional rend. Uh, bloodthirster of infetted infetted fury. Scar brand scar blood wrath. Um, slaughter priest, blood sacrifice, killer instinct, tunnel master being a rule from the new general's handbook, realm gore ritualist, which is bronze, f- bronze flesh, and uh, the he- priest, uh, he- the heel, heel from the, the universal prayer law, uh, blood, a- so the wraith axe, the bleeding icon, three s- mighty skull crushers, and then three units of five blood hounds coming in, flesh hounds. Everything's blood in this army. Like I'm surprised it's not called bloodhounds. Uh, wrapped up in a warlord and a battle reg uh, with an additional prayer. No surprise. Um, what is this? How does it work? Um, how does it win? So, can we? Maybe we should talk about the two bloodthirsters first, please. Um, so the insensate rage. Uh, he is. Traditionally, the damage dealer. Uh, he's my casino slot machine. Love him. He has this rule that any sixes to wound do, uh, when he's not bracketed, do four mortal wounds to all enemy units within eight inches. Not wholly within, just within. So if you get lucky and you roll two sixes to wound, you're doing eight mortal wounds to all enemy units within eight inches. That's just insane, right? You can You can kill support heroes just by doing that. Um, he hits on fours and he's only got five attacks. So that's a problem. Um, you're no longer rerunning ones. You can no longer give him double activation to make it 10 attacks. You can no longer give him an artifact to give him plus one attack. Um, you could use a uh, Wrathmongers to give him plus one attack, but it's still only then six attacks hitting on fours. Uh, you In Reapers of Vengeance, as we said, he's plus one to hit against heroes. So you are now five attacks hitting on threes. You're trying to maximize as many hits as you can, so you're making as many wound rolls as you can so that you can get those mortal wounds off with the, uh, on the sixes. But they have improved his damage. He used to be just a flat D6 damage, which meant that often, even though you'd get five hits, you'd roll, and you'd get five wounds, you wouldn't get any sixes, you'd do no mortals, and then you'd roll six, uh, five ones, and you'd only do five damage with him. They've improved it, so it's now D3 plus three. So every mm. hit is at least three, uh, at least four damage, yeah. which is way better than at least one. So his rage into a single unit, uh, sorry, his damage into a single unit is vastly improved just because of that D three plus three. But because we've lost the reroll ones to hit, we've also lost a prayer that gave him plus one to hit. We we used to have a prayer that we could give a unit plus one to hit. That's gone away. So he's now um, just. You know, sometimes you can get three to hit if you get uh, against a hero or you all have to attack him, but still five attacks, threes to hit. He's not the super most competitive pick any more that he once was, but I just live for that rush of those sixes to wound doing four mortal wounds. So I'm going to continue to take him. Plus, 
there's the psychological impact. You know that it's not going to happen, but your opponent in your opponent's head, he's thinking, wow, if he gets two sixes to wound, half my army's dead. Uh, so it's great. And I've been on the and I've been on the receiving end, and I'm sure men, or, or a lot of your opponents have had that happen where you're screening uh, an important support piece or a hero or whatever it is, that elite unit that's going to come in after the chaff line. Eight inches is a big, big range. Yeah. And if you can do those four mortal wounds and let's say you get lucky and you do eight or two of them, that that can really damage whether it is like significantly impact um, the, the damage table of a monster or a hero it can kill your general. It can kill so many things. And as you mentioned, the psychological threat at minimum, when I see the insensate rage, I'm probably thinking about keeping things outside of eight in case that happens. Yep. Or I'm like, like if I, well, I wasn't prepared, it can neuter my army. I, mean, I guarantee before every single game, I'm going to look at my opponent and say, this is the insensate rage. Do you know what he does? And if they say yes, great. If they say no, I'll explain what he does. And then I will say, one thing has changed. His first turn, top of one threat range, is now 24 inches plus 3d6. And you can see it in the head. They have to cope with that. They have to take the idea that if they deploy in any sort of castle, it's going to have to be way, 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 way back because 24 plus 3d6 is a huge threat range. And yet we know it's unlikely that you get two sixes to wound through, but it's a much bigger chance in their head than it is in mine. And I'm I'm okay with that. Yeah, so I you see people... You, you see people break up their castles. They are right. I don't want that to happen. Yeah. I'm breaking it up. I mean, the the Gits player that I played, you know, Gits want to castle because they have so many overlapping buffs. He lost 64 uh, models in, I think it was top of two. Um, he said, next time I'm not castling against you. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> don't, which is great because then he doesn't have all of those overlapping buffs. So, uh, you know, forcing your opponent to play differently from how they want to play just before deployment has started is great. So the, the threat is what makes him good. Um, I've made him my general. He probably shouldn't be my general. Um, should, probably should be the Fury. But I like taking um, this one's mine. And yeah, rage can kill a unit. You know, Often you see armies that have their general that just can't kill anything. Yeah. A rage can kill something. So this one's mine is a nice battle tactic to get. Yeah, it's one that I played around with in my Stormcast and having some options as a Killy General. I really enjoyed having that access to that. Um, yeah. But I, I can see the argument on both sides, whether you want to have this, you know, halo of blood, strike first, don't worry about your repercussions if it dies, but as long as it does maximum carnage on its way yeah. out. Or, yeah, be a bit more conservative, give the General to the Unfettered Fury, Um that kind of cleans up or is a second wave. And, you know, with making him a priest, it means he can go off turn one, do his thing and buff himself with, you know, plus one rend for the rest of the game or for however long he stays alive. Um, you know, so he's got that ability to just go off and be a threat by himself doing things. Uh, he can move himself in the hero phase. It's useful. Uh, he can even bless rate. himself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Quick one before we move to the Unfettered Fury or however you want to take it. Correct me if I'm wrong, the un the Insensate Rage used to have a whole bunch of additional rules on its war scroll. I remember going through one of them and it was like, it lost this, it lost this, it lost this. It's a very yeah. simple, basically I wanted to say like it's a simple war scroll and it, it seems to me that this is just the killing machine. They stripped it back and it's just like what it does, it does incredibly well. It only had the additional rule. I think it was reroll charges. And yes, it, it did lose that. Um, but yeah, it is an extremely simple um, mm. war scroll. But that one rule that it has is really good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so Fury is the second one. I think Fury is probably the best unit in the, the book. Um, he, so that what Fury used to do was it would give you the six-inch piling. They got rid of that. And so as soon as I saw, or I assumed that the book was going to get rid of the six inch piling. And I assumed that my Fury Thurster was going to go up on the shelf and never get seen again. But boy, was I wrong. He now has an aura that all enemy units that are within eight inches of him, not wholly, just within, and he's on a pretty big base, are minus one to hit. Mm. Shooting, combat, 
both. Just a flat minus one to hit debuff. You put him up behind your skull crushers. They're on a two up save and your opponents are minus one to hit them. It's just that that aura is fantastic. Plus, at the end of every combat phase, enemy units that are within eight inches of him on a four plus take D3 mortal wounds. Just some chip damage going on to all of the enemy units. And an 18-inch aura from an unfettered fury is pretty big. I think the competitive thing is actually to take two of them. Instead of the rage, take two furies. Just move them up. The whole board is minus one to hit, pretty much. You know, all, I guess all the, of your units. I guess the best thing as well is um, because they're the same price, Like you can play around with it and literally not impact your list at all. Exactly, yeah going to play around and as long you know particularly if you're playing with in a tournament or with friends who don't mind a little bit of proxying and make, say my rage is now a fury for this game um yeah you can play around and see which one you like uh, I, I think fury will be seen in most corn lists i also think he'll be a popular ally for other armies as well just to give that minus one to hit or uh, the possibility of doing d3 mortal wounds plus he's got a missile attack eight inches Four attacks, three threes, minus one D3. That's not nothing. And then he now hits much harder in combat than he used to. He's up to eight attacks, twos and twos, minus two. It is only D3 damage. I wish it was a flat two. I wish it was D3 plus one something. Um, so he's, it's not reliable D3. But twos and twos is awesome. <laughs> and eight attacks. I noticed that you're, I mean, you've also got another rule, the beck and the hunt, which we we kind of glossed over a little bit. That oh, yeah, no, I forgot about that, yeah. Allows you to pick one friendly Blades of corn unit that's wholly within 16 that's not a hero that lets them charge 3D6. So whether it be in this particular list, I imagine the Skull Crushers would be a great recipient, obviously Flesh yep. Hounds in the right situation, uh, Blood Letters if you were to choose them. Um, I'm sure there's lots oh, yeah. of different... So yeah, what I've been... If you don't do the move the Skull Crushers up and move into combat in their hero phase, if you just want to get the charge off because they do have uh, impact hits, you, know, you can get some mortars off on the charge, so you might want to charge them, then yeah, they're an obvious target for the 3d6 charge. Also, I find myself summoning blood letters quite often. Uh, summon some blood letters. They come in nine away. They've now got a 3d6 charge. That makes that charge a lot easier. Well, I and mean, yeah, a, statistic and they get, st statistically, you hit it. I mean... Yeah, they've got a plus one or a plus two to charge anyway. So, yeah, you get you summon and guarantee the charge. Great. Yeah, I'll take it. So, yeah, Furies are amazing. Yeah, um, I dig it. I dig it. And, and you obviously got the King Daddy himself, Scarbrand. So Scarbrand actually, doesn't need to be talked about, really. He's just amazing. Can I ask you then, just really quickly then, why why did the Wrath of Corn Bloodthirster miss out in this list? So you got three Thirsters there, one being named. What what made this particular one not be included? I'm not a big, big fan of the Wrath. Um, he's got the same attack profile in combat as the Fury, so eight attacks, twos, twos, minus two, D3. Again, it's okay. It's fine. Um, he's got some. He's got better shooting attack. He can do some mortal wounds with shooting, but it's only D three, I think. Um, yeah, it's it, it, it's not going to win you a game very often. His shooting attack, and then his only special ability is that when he attacks, another bloodthirster gets to attack, um, but not Scarbrand. Hmm. So, if you are taking Scarbrand then the only reason you take a Wrath is you give Wrath strike first, he strikes first, and then your other Bloodthirster strikes first as well. It does have some play, but I just don't find that I'm doing that. I need to worry about that very often. In my turn, I strike first with a Rage, and then I go with Scarbrand, and that's done enough damage that I'm pretty happy. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to give up a Fury for a Wrath. I wouldn't want to give up Scarbrand for a Wrath. I can absolutely see people giving up a rage for a wrath, but if they're going to do that, I think two furies is better than a wrath. I mean, like you get the free command point, like you once per turn, it can issue a command point, a command without a point being spent. Uh, if we look, maybe, maybe in a horde meta, like if we happen to go into a horde meta again, where we got zombies and gits and beasts of chaos and lots of lots of bodies, 
Maybe the Hellfire Breath comes into play where the attack characteristic is it becomes 10 on the on the shooting attack, like maybe, and then obviously the double fight through through the commander of tyrants. But when I look at the profile compared to the others, I probably tend to agree. I'd probably say the Unfettered Fury and the Insensate Rage are probably the two ones I prefer just on having very clear and defined things that it wants to do while the Wrath feels a little bit more of a utility piece. Yeah. I will say we used to be an extremely command point hungry army. There are essentially no command abilities in this book. Mm. So we are just using all out attack for the rage, all out defense now and then. We're not that um, command point hungry anymore. Um, so, you know, if you're playing mortals, yeah, you'll want to rally. Obviously, in my list, I'm never rallying. Uh, redeploys, we've got so many other movement shenanigans. I don't really have to worry about redeploys that often. So I don't find myself running out of command points very often at all. Yeah, I've got a warlord, warlord battalion that gets me an extra one. I often forget about that because it just never comes up. Um, I, I never wish, oh, I had, wish I had another uh, command point right now. So the spending one without using it, uh, or without, sorry, using one without spending it, uh, it's, I just don't think it's that strong in this yeah. book. The last yeah, book, agree. it would have been amazing. And the, the, there was an artifact that did that in the last book. And that was very popular, but this time, not so much. Agreed. I agree. Thank, thank you for entertaining. Cause I think probably people are thinking about like, why is that particular one not in the list versus the other two, but what, what else are the combinations and how this all working together? Um, so I've got to talk about my boy scar scar blood wrath for me is an auto take. Um, he's, he is a mortal. I've got a little creature cast a demon that I use as him. So mine's a demon, but technically he's a mortal. Um, he has two fantastic things about him. First of all, he hits on twos, work uh, wounds on threes, minus one, one damage. He's got five attacks, but his attack profile is a minimum of five. It's actually the number of enemy models within three inches of him with no limit. I was certain they were going to impose a limit, you know, to a maximum of 10. A lot yeah. of them have that max. It's like a maximum of 10, maximum of eight. Yeah, this literally has no, whatever it is, whatever is higher. Yeah, I regularly put him into, you know, you're playing against Gits. Okay, he's got 30 attacks, you know, <laughs> great. Twos and threes minus one, one damage. So he can actually kill stuff. Okay, again, against Suns, yeah, he's doing nothing. But uh, against hordes, he can actually do some some serious damage to them. But that's not why you take him. You take him for this one little rule that says that when he dies, at the end of the movement phase, you roll two dice, and then on an eight plus, he comes back alive anywhere on the board, nine inches away. Note that this is the movement phase. So you roll in your opponent's turn and yours. And you, you can choose when to roll. And no wounds allocated, so he's fully, yeah, fully he's fresh. Fully, he's Six back wounds. Uh, you know, the obviously you can't plan around this because it's on an eight plus, which is again a forty percent chance. But you've got, um, you know, you, uh, towards the end of the game, your opponent's got two home objectives, and he's left them. In their, you know, in their turn, you just summon Scarbrand. He's now on their objective. That stops them from getting more, maybe or something. In your turn, you pop him up on one objective, and because it's at the end of the movement phase and you choose the order, he can then summon. Mm. So you can bring him up, and then he can immediately summon. So you know, you, I was talking earlier about maybe summoning, summoning a skull cannon uh, behind them. How do you get behind them to summon? You use Scar. So he's just a torpedo. I send him up straight away, um, attack as many, you know, do as much damage as he can, but hoping he will die. Uh, he's only got six wounds. Fine, he'll die quickly. The sooner he dies, the better for me because that gives me more chances to bring him back. And that's um, the also, horde, that's the horde clearer that that's the horde clearer that we were just talking about with like why you might take the wrath of corn. Well, now there's an that that's now that role's being filled. Yeah, yeah, just shoot him up the board. Plus, we said earlier that um, you know what you're going to want to do turn one is blood sacrifice to so get yourself a blood tithe. Blood sacrifice involves causing mortal wounds to one of your units. I don't choose Scar. Just, yeah, I want Scar to die, so I'm, I'm happy to choose him. Uh, so he's my my blood sacrifice target. 
No, I yeah. dig it. I, I like it. And to be honest with you, as an opponent, like most people would look at your list and Scar Blood Wrath is like the least of my worries at this point. Yeah, but he will win you so many games just mm. by popping up. Okay, yeah. Even things like um, you've got some enemy unit that's got a huge amount of movement and they've declared that they're going to kill one of your guys. No, you're not. Scar Blood Wrath is moving in between. Now you can't move where you want to move to make that charge. It's just, again, movement or in this case, a sort of quasi summon in your opponent's turn is so strong, it will win your games. And for 100 points, yeah, every time. Could be worth the that one point murder loss. That that could be the perfect example of being going in pinning down your enemy, and if he dies, yeah. cool. On the eight plus, it's back. So then yeah. you got a blood tie. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Uh, if you, yeah, I've got the wrath axe. The wrath axe is just a. I use the wrath axe for two things. One, it's a charge blocker. It's on a big base. You put it out. If you don't want your bloodthirster getting charged from a certain angle, you put the wrath axe next to it blocks the charge um you know you can move through incantations but if it's right next to your base they can't land on it and so they can't charge you but also if you absolutely need two blood tithe in your turn you blood sacrifice against scar and then you wrath axe him and you just kill him in your turn two blood tithe it's handy um so that's scar then i've got the priest and the ritualist you know prayers are awesome done Tunnel Master on the Priest, just generally just towards the end of the game, he teleports and he summons behind them. Uh, useful. I got Bronze Flest on the Ritualist. It's just the, uh, if you decide you are going to use your Insensate Rage as the torpedo before you send him off in the top of one, you put Bronze Flesh on him, give him a three plus save. Why not? Uh, Bleeding Icon, it's an auto take. I was, just, I was just rereading i'm literally just rereading it because the first question before i get you to explain it is hex gorgeous skulls is like the number one invocation that every corn priest takes since the dawn of time yet yep. you do not have it so i guess what is the bleeding icon for anyone who hasn't reread it um but two why wouldn't you have the hex gorgeous skulls and and well, what let's start with why not it? the hex gorgeous skulls i and mm. Absolutely, they're useful, and I could absolutely see myself dropping the Wrath Axe and taking the Skulls instead. But um, you're kind of guaranteed... Yeah, they're only useful against Magic Armies. Fine, I'll get. I'll go to a tournament and I'll play Fire Slayers, KO, Suns, and something. You know, it just it doesn't do anything. Um, secondly, uh, they've decreased the range of the Skulls. It used to be mm. it was minus two to cast if you were within 12. It's now within eight. And that's quite a big difference. Um, so the, the usefulness of the skulls has gone down a little bit. Uh, why the icon? One, it's on a huge base. So I can again use it to uh, charge block. If I am against suns, it's going to do nothing. But it's still going to stop them from charging me. If I've got the axe and the icon protecting me, that's, that's a lot of space that uh, opponents are not going to be able to charge me on. Secondly, it's actual rules. Uh, it moves eight, and then enemies within eight, not holy, just within eight, cannot use Inspiring Presence. And if they fail a battle shock test, an additional D3 or perhaps D6 flee. That's huge. You know, just turning off Inspiring Presence against, again, particularly in this current meta where we're seeing a lot of hordish uh, units, it's really strong to be able to stop them from doing it. And it's this even... Is your... Go on, go on, sorry. It's I a just said, that that was literally what was coming out of my mouth. That was yeah. it's literally what I was going to say. Was it's that, a horror gas that often they can't get rid of because the only way they can get rid of it is if they have a priest, and a lot of our armies do not have. You know, most armies don't have a priest, so this is just not going away. It's staying there, and they cannot use inspiring presence. I will say but that I the threat range is the, the the threat range is incredible because it's a you cast it within eight. Then it can yep. move eight, but if yep. your priest is within is range in of the, the skull altar. altar, you're doubling the range. So it's now move sixteen. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's, it's summoned within sixteen, then a move yep. of eight, and then so it's got a range of twenty four, and then an aura of eight. Yeah, that it's getting into your opponent's army turn one. Again, if you're playing against, I know uh, some destruction army, you gets 
even iron jaws or whatever, where they've got a few units. If you're able to just plink off two models from every unit and then you have the uh, the bleeding icon down, they're, they're losing stuff. Yeah. It's really nice. Also, I, will I say think one it more... works slightly differently from Horagas, and I, I might be wrong on this, but it's um, if your opponent uses the uh, the triumph to ignore battle shock, this still does something because the triumph says that uh, if you fail a battle shock, zero models flee. It's not that you don't take a battle shock, so they. Zero models would flee, but then the bleeding icons ability kicks in and an additional D3 flee. So even if they use their triumph, still some models are going to flee. I'll have to work out the timing. Yeah, we'll, 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 yeah we'll have to look at but, the rules. I get I, I get the feeling that that wouldn't work, but let's let's like pretend yeah. there's potential there. Yeah, there's something going on. Uh, so that's the there. incantations. And then, yeah, Mighty Skull Crushers, we've talked about them. Two plus save. Five wounds each, big bases, five up, um, magic mortal wound ward. Yeah, they're just they're just the tankiest unit in the game almost. They're really strong. Uh, movement eight, they can get across the board. They can tie up units. It's great. And flesh hounds, they have an unbind. So you know this list has four unbinds with the slaughter priest and the three units of uh, flesh hounds. Um, and again, they move eight. They on cavalry bases, five of them take up a lot of space. They they are screen, and again, and with um, you put them into enemy heroes in Reapers of Vengeance. They're hitting on twos, mm. uh, four attacks each. That's twenty attacks from each unit, hitting on twos. Yeah, they're only wounding on fours, but it's still something. Uh, if you do take curse, twenty attacks per that's uh, twenty attacks per flesh hound unit. That can do some damage with curse. And they get a plus two to their charge as well. So great yes. for summoning and getting them they into combat from a summon. Yeah. Or, you know, to if you've used your uh, re-roll the charge, you know, use them at the end. Um, a great way to get them in. I do want to make one quick connection just in case anyone hasn't made the connection as well. With your bleeding icon being able to shut off inspiring presence um, with, uh, with opponents who have gone in and like as a Gits player, I am definitely thinking about my list and how I get the um, the battle shock immunity triumph, basically. Um, so one of the ways that you can avoid that is obviously to get lower points yep. in order to stop me from getting it to begin with. So uh, the fact that you're 1960 is great. If there are other ways where you can bring that down even further, especially if the meta does continue to go down this route, um, might be worth considering dropping, you know, the Wrath Axe altogether, going in at what 19 or 1890 or filling it in well, with something that would be small. insane. But yeah. Well, you are seeing some players going in at around that time, like but but you know what I mean? Like if the meta evolves in that area, it might be a consideration. Well, and there. if there's a couple of tweaks, if you take out the slaughter priest and put in another ritualist, you get 10 more points, you're at 1950, then you can afford to put skulls in. So then there you've you got go. all three incantations, gives you flexibility. Sometimes, you know, again, if you're going against an army that doesn't take battle shock OBR, then bleeding icon is not doing as much, but skulls might do something. So having that flexibility is, would be nice. Um, you know, incantations are, are, are great just because your opponent can't get rid of them. Yeah, generally. agreed. And by the way, I'm not saying for you to tailor your list because of gits. That's just one problem. It's going to be useless to everyone else, but it's a consideration. Mm hmm. Uh, anything else you'd say about this list or do you want to show off your second one no I, I mean i'll say this is probably the list that i'll be playing for quite a while um this is my fun list and yeah so far i've been enjoying it you know, maybe tweak the incantations um there's a couple of other units i may swap in and out but this is this is probably the list that you'll see me play the second one, uh, alternatively, we've got a Blood Lords, which is take what's theirs, uh, Bloodthirsty again. Uh, so there's a, a few similarities, but a lot of differences too. So there is a uh, Unfettered Fury Bloodthirster, which is the general with the embodiment of Wrath. Scarbrand, Slaughter Priest uh, with Blood Sacrifice, Witchbane Curse, a Blood Master, Halo of Blood, Bl Bronze Flesh, Killing, Killer Instinct, and Tunnel Master. Uh, it has the Herald on Blood Throne with Curse and Killer Instinct with our mate Scar Blood Wrath as well. 
uh, two units of flesh hounds, a uh, unit of 20 blood letters, three uh, blood crushes with the bleeding icon. So this is wrapped up in Galatian Command and the Warlord. So 1970, 10 drops. So uh, you could not care less about Battle Regiment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I generally don't like going low drop simply because, again, the way that I like to win games is by my opponent making mistakes and the more decisions you make your opponent make uh the more mistakes they're going to make and choosing whether to go first or second is the biggest decision they can make and so let's let give them the choice um yeah this one is basically built around blood letters um the the prayers i've got in there you can switch them around uh you know all, as we said all of the prayers are good i do have curse because the flesh hounds and that little play with the blood letters may be doing fives and the attack sequence ends. Uh, mortal wounds on fives and the attack sequence ends. Mortal wounds on sixes and it doesn't end. Uh, the blood crushers, these are the you know the blood letters on the hound thing. They're not as good as the skull crushers in terms of tankiness, but they're also doing mortal wounds on fives to hit with their swords. So they have some play. Um, the the interesting one here, you've got the, the unfettered fury, again, that minus one to hit and the mortal wound uh, ability plus the d3 charge to the blood crushers is really nice he's got the command trait that allows him to bring back models to the blood letters which is awesome um, but the artifact went to the blood master again so he strikes first and then the blood letters are allowed to strike first and they're in galatian command so he can fight in the hero phase and they can fight in the hero phase uh, so there's you know you just send him up uh probably rather than tunnel mark so you give him um, Rage of Gur, so that yes. he goes in, he dies, he comes back, and he's still able to swing, and the blood letters are able to swing. Obviously, you're going to be spending blood tithe to just summon more and more blood letters all the time. Uh, Scar is there doing the same thing as he was before. Uh, Scar Brand is there doing the same thing. But yeah, this is built around the idea that your blood letters are just doing mortals on fives. Yeah. Yeah, I've just with so many attacks coming through. Would you can you whip them with the wrath mongers? Like you can, and that's obviously a, a, a pretty good uh play to make. You could either drop the blood crushers or uh scar if you wanted to uh to put in some wrath mongers to get them plus one attack. Uh the uh the herald on blood throne, so you got the prayer that brings some back. I think so. So I think he can pray to bring back models to the blood letters if you roll a one on battle shock you're bringing models back to the blood letters the command trait is bringing back models to the blood letters so they can actually be you know just rejuvenating and none of those things uh require you to be out of combat so and, and that's the great thing is that you know we can tweak these lists however you want to tweak it like you know maybe uh, the way i would run this is probably have like a blood secretor maybe I haven't really thought this through, right? So don't like don't at me and quote me on this one. But like you can you can take this and and tweak it to your liking. Whether you want to still run the the blood uh, the mighty skull crushers instead of blood crushers, or if you want to bring something in, it's different. Like there's so many great options, and your book is deep enough that you can tweak as the meta evolves. But it's a great example of how you might use. It's a lot of blood letters, and they've got yeah, five I mean, up rally. They they they've got a five up rally, don't they? No, they don't. They have um, mm. they just have to bring models back on a one for pedal shock plus the other ah. ability bring back. I mean, yes, this is a blood letter list, but I've only got one unit. The idea is you know you're just summoning more. Yeah, yeah, you're just absolute killy. Eh, you're not worried at all about high high drops on this one. Same reason I you know just I think to get corn into a one drop. It's going to be really difficult to get him in, to get corn into a two drop. It's going to be difficult, so you may as well just go high and let your opponent let you go. Like going first is not a particular problem for corn. You can get up your um, bronze flesh to get plus one save on your anvil, and you you've got enough movement to be able to move in and tie and do stuff in their turn. You can get your bleeding icon out into their lines. You can get your Rathax out into the lines, maybe to do some damage. Uh, you know, you can. You have enough uh, flavor that going first in turn one is not such a big deal. 
Yeah, and that was going to be my thing is that like you, a lot of people talk about the race to the bottom. You want to be one drop, you want to be three drops. But for you, because you've got threats, whether it's turn one, turn two, it's sorry, t- bottom, top of the turn or the bottom of the turn, it's actually quite relaxing. So you're like, you know what? Well, I actually don't care. Yeah. Um, I've got tools and resources. I can put up these certain buffs in turn one. I can, as you've said, I don't charge right forward and like I'll, I'll hold back. I'll just put up my buffs. I'll, I'll screen and position cap objectives. But or I'll use certain hero phase uh, abilities through the, the 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 blood tithe to do what I need to do. So that is quite good. Where some of the armies that I run, I really got to be winning the 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 priority role at the top of turn one, or I need well, yep. g- determining who goes first. Particularly if you're able to screen well, and you know they they wipe out your screens turn one. Okay, you've just given me blood tithe. That's- that's what those things were for. I'm like, fine. Yeah. Um, a couple of honorable mentions that um, didn't make it into my list. So the two are warbands, uh, Maggles Fiends. Um, this counts. The nice thing about them is you get a free flesh hound that is yes. just a single model that is a unit by himself. So you deploy him, he's your blood sacrifice target, he dies immediately. You've got two blood tithe immediately. Great. And then uh, Garrick's Reavers, 70 points for a unit. And if they do get into combat and they do some damage to somebody, you get an extra blood tithe just from causing a wound. You get blood tithe from them. Yeah. So both of those things are quite nice. It's just extra blood tithe generators and just a little screen that you can put somewhere. Yeah, it's good. Good shout. Good old uh, Rip Tooth, the one single flesh hound. Like, as I looked at him like, First thing I looked at when I looked at that rule, I'm like, I wonder if I can rally up to five, but it specifically says one flesh hound that consists of one model. I'm like, damn it. Yep. Like, I was like, I'm rally five flesh hounds. There's, look, there's so many great things. There's also some Plus, trash. Uh, like, also, the, the, um, the rule on Magos Fiends with that flesh hound is that when you deploy them, they immediately can summon. So you can actually put that flesh hound outside of your deployment zone doesn't say it has to be in your deployment zone. They can just summon and it has to be within nine inches. So he's you've suddenly got a unit you know, blocking a charge or something nine inches away from your deployment zone. Great. Yeah, that's a really good call, actually. Um, do, you have, do, you, do you have any thoughts on... And I've got a couple of burning questions, then we'll kind of bring this home. This has been great. It's like two and a half hours. And we could get into like the weeds of every single war <laughs> scroll, but I think you've been very clear on what we like, what we don't like. Um, you know, there's some things like, unfortunately, the old Skylar that uh, still is going to stay retired for a little bit. Uh, you know, Corgrass. Corgrass. What are your thoughts on the other two warbands, Drom and um, the Claws of Karanak? They, they, they kind of like interesting ones that I haven't fully explored yet and seen properly on the table. But again, they're quite new. I'm not a huge fan of Drom. I don't particularly like his... Uh, War Scroll Prayer, which does damage in a straight line. Uh, he's more expensive than the other priests. So I think I'd rather just take a Slaughter Priest. Uh, I do like his model. I've, um, I'm have i using his model as a general Slaughter Priest, converted to be a demon, obviously. Um, yeah, the rest of his Warband, they're just, eh. You know, some, he stays alive longer than a normal Slaughter Priest would, but I don't care. My Slaughter Priests are usually at the back, not getting targeted anyway. So I, I don't really care for that one. Um, the uh, Karanax friends, the, cla- the claws of Karanax. Claws of Karanax. Yeah, those are um, those are good. Uh, well, actually, Karanak himself is actually a pretty good unit now. He's got this funky ability that allows him to move in the opponent's movement phase again. Any time that you can move in your opponent's turn is awesome. So he's great for that. Plus, he allows you to summon flesh hounds into combat. Yes, uh, within within eight, within eight of, of him. So, uh, but but it allows you to summon within combat as long as you're within yes. eight of the the, the so, hero. Um, you know, that's not particularly good. If if it wasn't that holy within eight is is kind of restrictive, but it's useful. Um, but the 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 friends of Karanak, their battle line. Uh, so that you know, and we don't have that many battle line choices. So, um, they're, they're pretty useful. I can absolutely see them getting play. They have a decent they, amount of tax. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't notice that. Cause of Karanaka battle line. 
or friends of Karanak, as they should be called from now on. <laughs> yeah. Two more burning questions. Um, one, one is one I haven't asked for a while, but I think this is a relevant one for you is uh, our friend, the Cronspine. Because mm -hmm. a part of the Boom Thurster list, we did see uh, certain certain builds where the Cronspine was playing uh, is either a buff piece or another threat piece to go along with the Boom Thursters. Do you think Cronspine is good investment or useful in a in the corn list today? I do. I mean, I ran him in the old book for a while. Um, I think I probably could see someone running him as well. His big thing, um, yeah, his movement. 12 or 14 i can't remember 14 maybe um he's fast oh, anyway and he can fly and so you can absolutely see a play where you've got a unit of maybe six um skull crushers that you put bronze flesh on so they're on a one-up save you hero phase move them up the board you engage the entirety of your opponent's army you move the incarnate up they cannot retreat mm. so they're just then pinned by those skull crushers that are on a one-up save uh, maybe you give them bless as well because you've got the priests to do that, so they get a six at ward. That's that's going to be an annoying play. So I, I can see that having some use. And yeah, the the incarnate is obviously it was very popular for a long time. Um, so yeah, I, I can see it having some play. Competitive, but maybe not auto include. Yeah, yeah. A question that came from a listener, and this will be one of our last questions, is because uh, we didn't really quite talk about this, and it was the skull cannons. And do you have any thoughts on how to buff skull cannons? Uh, to quote my friend from uh, Facebook, thank you for the question. Um, they have been waiting a long time to pull their three out of the cabinet. I wonder if they was they bought them when Facehammer talked about the skull cannon buffing with Wrathmongers, and then they've sat in the cupboard ever since. There isn't really a way to buff them in their shooting attacks. Um, if you're in Reapers of Vengeance, is Reapers of Vengeance tied to melee attacks? I don't think it is. Oh, you you, you keep talking. I'll, I'll quickly I'll bring okay. up the. So they are a demon unit. So yes. if um, they do get the plus one to hit against heroes, then yeah, you could absolutely see bringing them in to snipe some enemy heroes. Uh, I think it's threes and threes, so it would be twos and threes. Add one to hit rolls for attacks made by friendly Reapers of Vengeance demon units that target an enemy hero. Yeah, so it works for shooting as well. Yeah. Um, it may get FAQ'd because, you know, that's the way that Games Workshop likes to nerf the cannons. Um, but so, yeah, it would be four attacks, twos and threes, minus two D3 damage. That could do something to a little support hero who is not um, in, you know, next to a battle line. Or, you, yeah, you can't put your cannons in sharpshooters. Is there artillery? No. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe one or two in a starting army. As I said before, I could I could absolutely see them getting summoned now and then, particularly if you've got Scar or you've got a Tunnel Master, just pop up in behind the enemy, summon a Skull Cannon, pink off some wounds. The fact that they decreased their range to 18 is, is problematic. You know, you're not... Mm. Turn one, you're not often going to be able to shoot stuff with them. But they do move eight, so maybe... And you can't Plus, reinforce re them either. No. I mean, and if you really wanted to like double down on that, you could do the plus one to wound triumph for them as well, but that's only going to help one of three. Yeah. I mean, there is one of the prayers on one of the wall scores, I think, is plus one to wound for demons. Maybe Melee or? Yeah. yeah. I, can, I, can't, I can't see too many shooting buffs in corn, but... Oh my gosh, there's a lot that we could talk about here and it's been absolute pleasure having you on the channel finally. I appreciate I'm glad that I finally invited you. Uh it's been a while. I've been, wa I've been watching you perform on the ITC so uh this is my gift to you. But um oh, is there anything you. else you want to add? Like maybe maybe the last question is if I'm a newish kind of corn player and I'm I, I got excited by the book, but the the book, I've started my army for the first time. What's your parting wisdom on how do I win? Like, what are the, some of the considerations? What are some of the the tools or the linchpins? Or, like, what's that final thing that you would tell me about on on doing well with corn? If you want to do well with corn, don't think that it's just going to go in and kill stuff. You don't win the game by killing stuff with corn very often. 
Uh, you win by outmaneuvering your opponent and denying them from doing what they want to do. That's how you have to think about corn, I think. Of course, somebody will prove me wrong and will just take some killy list that just kills everything on the table. But the way that I think corn is played still is by outmaneuvering your opponent. Look, you definitely can. Like, if if you want iron jaws in chaos, you can absolutely do that. There's, 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 you can, and 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 your army is great for doing it. We've already talked about the speed. We've talked about some of the movement shenanigans in yours and my turn. Uh, there's a lot of obviously combat orientated buffs. You can do that, but I think to your point, if you'd go that route, you do miss on a lot of the tricks and the shenanigans that corn does that can force your opponent to make errors to be able to really play a great interactive strategic game. But right. we, we don't do you. We don't have a more crusher with destroyer and plus one damage war chanter buff. Um, in terms of damage output, even Scarbrand doesn't match that. And we also don't have the durability of a more crusher, even with our five plus ward and now 16 wounds on our bloodthirsters. So you, you if you just go in charging in without any thought, you'll kill some stuff, but then you'll die. Yep, yep. So if you're going to do it, be very smart on where you go and make sure that what you kill, you're going to have to kill because otherwise, yeah. I mean, yeah, you got some extra wounds, as you said, and you will lose your ward because you won't be in range, but it's the trade-off. Yeah. Tomo, this has been awesome. Um, if people want to find out more, uh, your Twitter handle will be down below. Um, people, you're in the SoCal, you're in the, uh, the California area, so... You run lots of tournaments under the Old Town Throwdown banner. Um, any shout-outs, anything you want to say before we bring this home? Um, obviously, I have to shout out Old Town Throwdown. We run a number of tournaments per year. Our largest one is August 13th, 14th this year in Southern California. Uh, if you're interested, tickets are available. Just go to oldtownthrowdown.com. Come to sunny California. Uh, the event is like 20 minutes away from Disneyland and the beaches and all that kind of stuff. So have a good time. And uh, I'd like to think they are generally thought of as being well-run, fun tournaments. I've, uh, I mean, they sell out really quickly. And uh, I've seen some photos where like the people have had like the, the champion's cloak, like in the cyclists, like as you're kind of progressing. Um, yeah. I always, I always enjoy, you, you have a really good competitive scene but it's not vanilla. Like there's always something special that's happening throughout the the series and the different types of tournaments. So um, I'd highly recommend it, whether you travel or you're local. Um, it's certainly one that's on my bucket list. Thanks. Anything else? No. I mean, shout out to all of my local players who will, would undoubtedly have been flooding the comments if we were live. Yes. Well, thank you for everyone. If you've, if you've come back to this and um, I really do appreciate the fact that our stream decided to work not on a Sunday. It's like, nah, man, this is my rest day. Uh, so we've recorded this and not a single crash. No. So touch wood, we've gone two and a half hours, not a single crash. So don't know what happened there, but I hope you enjoyed this uh, stream. Uh, Tomo, thank you so much for your persistence and giving us such great insight. Again, number one ITC and TSN ranked corn player. So you know what's going on, but in the comment section, let me know what you're thinking. Uh, maybe some units that we haven't talked about, some combinations that we haven't explored, some things that you've found since you're testing. Uh, you know the deal. Let us know in the comment section. I'll be curious to hear how you are unpacking this corn book, but Tomo, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video, as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spell cast.